Good morning and welcome everyone to H2O's Innovation Day Summer 22 Summer 2022 broadcast. We have a great program teed up for you over the next couple hours. Uh, my name is Tara Beebe and I am part of the marketing team here at H2O. And um, a couple different things before I introduce our first speakers. Um, you will see at the bottom of your screen, you have the ability to both ask questions and to chat and interact with those who are here, including our speakers. So feel free to ask questions throughout the event. Um, and what we'll go ahead and do is either have our speakers answer them as content is displayed, or we'll have some time at the end. So again, we have a great program set up. We're going to kick it off with um, several of our H2O customers, and they're going to share how they are um, undertaking AI transformation within their organizations. And then we will hand it over to our product leaders and you'll have the ability to hear some of the latest and greatest features and announcements coming out in H2O Solutions with questions at the end. So with that, I would like to introduce our first speakers, um, Reed Maloney and Vinod Iyengar. Can you go ahead and join us? Thanks, Tara. Hey, Vinod, hey. how are you doing? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm doing great. We got a great show for you all today. You know, we're going to run through uh, some of the some of the innovations that have that have passed to build our entire AI cloud, and then we're going to jump into the customers that have been driving an immense amount of success in their organizations um, using H2O and driving and, and building off a, a huge number of business use cases across industries. So I'm really excited about the panel. And I guess we got an hour to go through all the new innovations. Um, that Vinod and his team have gone through in the next hour. The other thing I saw, Vinod, is we got people from all over the world. We yeah, got, I'm just seeing this uh, from Canada, like the latest ones are like, you know, Quebec, Canada, Montreal, Greece, Germany. Germany. Uh, and then uh, and then someone said they're from North Carolina. I didn't see who that was. I caught a quick glimpse. I went to school there. I went to Duke. Uh, I miss it, but I do not miss it in the summer. So I'm out of Seattle. We are having... We had the worst spring ever. We were having the best. What's like the I, I always try to convert to centigrade now that I know how many people are on here. It's like 75 every day right now. And that's like we get eight weeks of that. And then all of a sudden uh, we're back into not that. So we have summer and not summer here. And I know that is not your case, Vinod. It is much, much nicer. Yeah, we, we got great <laughs> weather. Well, today is a little cloudy in the morning. I'm in San Francisco Bay Area, um, California. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, this is generally very sunny every year. We call it sunny California. But um, today is a cloudy day. But hopefully it'll get uh, sunny before we get too far along. Absolutely. Well, this is this is great. So, um, you know, what we're going to, what we want to do is just sort of show a little bit about like maker culture and just how innovative H2O is and sort of why we innovate as well. And, you know, it really comes back to helping the customers be successful. And so it really started with H2O3. Uh, H2O3 is our open source distributed machine learning. Uh, it's really what made H2O famous as a company. Um, we, we believe we have a million data scientists using H2O. And it really comes from the fact that this is the easiest way to run a, um, machine learning across a broad data set. And as we built out H2O and we had a huge number of customers using it, we started listening to what they needed and that led to H2O driverless AI. And so H2O driverless AI helped our data scientists and our community build even faster and often find insights in their data that maybe they hadn't seen, and then they were able to go and move much more quickly in terms of solving business problems and delivering value to the business. And honestly, in the last couple of years, just even like the last few years, we've built so much more. This year, we built H2O Hydrogen Torch, which is no-code deep learning, which we'll talk a little bit more about today. We've built H2O Document AI, which helps, helps us to build intelligent document models. So we can have a wide variety of formats. And if you were looking at the B-roll video we just had started with, and that was Bob Rogers talking from UCSF, they're able to take this huge variety of referrals coming in. They all look different. And the AI is able to say, this is a referral, and then also find where the information it needs on the, on the facts, even though it's in different places. So that's really unique. And that's why we, we think about it as intelligent document models. And then we've also launched H2O Wave. Uh, and this, is, this helps uh, our makers make AI apps. So we're able to have the AI consumed much more easily by the business user. And it also helps to bridge a communication gap, which we'll, we'll likely talk about on the panel today between the business and the data science teams or the analytics teams. 
that are trying to help them solve those problems. And that's such a common issue. Um, and Sean, I know we've talked about this uh, and I'll introduce Sean in a second, um, that, that linking that, that business unit with the, the data science often lead, that doesn't happen leads to challenges in a lot of organizations about getting AI adopted and H2O Wave is really built um, and built to help bridge that, bridge that divide. And we launched a whole set of innovation around uh, helping customers operate AI at scale around H2O ML Ops or H2O AI Feature Store. Uh, and so Prince, who, who is really involved with that from AT&T and is a co-created product, we'll talk a little bit more. He's on our panel today, which is awesome. Um, and then we've been able to, to deploy this where you can basically run your models that you're building and score them anywhere. So you can score them in Snowflake, you can score them in your Java environment, you can score them on H2O ML Ops, and then you can run it on any cloud. And then we've launched a, our HOAA app store. So we're again, helping the business find the apps that they can use to consume the AI. And then we have a huge set of pre-built applications, um, not just for, not for, for a whole a variety of different departments, uh, but also different industries like financial services, insurance, et cetera, healthcare that you can go in and use to help accelerate um, your journeys even more. So it's really exciting uh, and this has all happened. Everything I just sort of went through one by one, that's all happened the last couple of years. And again, that's just to make, that's the maker culture here. We are really innovative and that pace of innovation as we grow and as our customers adopt is only accelerating. And so again, why are we building what we're building? Well, it comes down to meeting the requirements of our customers for them to be successful. So what we hear from customers is they want us to support all use cases, everything from big data to text and audio data, time series data, you know, we support it all. We want to be able, they want to be able to deliver very quickly, but they want to be able to deliver quickly on, uh, on projects that matter to the business. And so that's that different interfaces, no, no code deep learning, like we just talked about, one click to deployment, advanced auto ML that we support. We want to support multiple users so they can democratize AI, which we also have. Um, it's easy to explain, monitor and govern. It provides the highest level of accuracy, which gives them the most business value. And they're able to integrate into their existing data apps and tools. And so when we look at that, all of that innovation we've put together into the AI cloud, like why the H2 AI cloud it provides the fastest time to value for any use case, you know, across having multiple interfaces, having the best auto ML, having intelligent document AI, no code, deep learning, optimized recipes, a huge plethora of pre-built applications, it's really de designed to help you deliver value to your business. We have the most comprehensive set of explainable AI capabilities so that you can trust the AI that you're building. And then we have the most flexible architecture. So it can integrate across any of the systems you have. You can score anywhere. You can run it in any cloud. And so we've really built it so that, um, and, and again, it goes back to open source as well. You're just providing flexibility so it can work within the systems that, that you have to drive business value. So with that, let's talk to the customers who are really driving, you know, helping to drive our roadmap and driving our innovation and are doing some really cool things with AI. Uh, so we have Prince. Prince is the AVP of Data Insights from AT&T. Sean, welcome. Uh, Director of Advanced Analytics from AES. And Chris, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. He's a Managing Director, head of Global Head of Data Science from Castleton Commodities International. And, you know, what we're going to do is just kick off Gents, we'll go, we'll go in that order. If you don't mind, just you, can you introduce yourself, the company you work for? I'm sure no, no one's ever, you know, the, the, and, and a little bit about your role. You know, what are, what are you doing and where are you on your journey you know, um, from, the, uh, from an AI maturity perspective? You know, how far along are you? Are you just getting started? Are you really deep? You have thousands of models in production. Do you have business units creating their own AI? Or are you guys mainly doing it centrally? And just add a little bit of that, and then uh, we'll go deeper into some other questions about how you guys are driving success. Sure. Thanks, Reid. Um, I'm Prince Paul Raj from AT&T, uh, Chief Data Office. Um, I lead the data science team here uh, for fraud prevention and detection and um, uh, take care of the global supply chain management, um, AI uh, standpoint, and tax. And, and then various across, you know, uh, BUs. Uh, we kind of play as an horizontal role and uh, help 
each and every business unit to, to innovate uh, with the data and AI. So that's pretty much what I do in at and um, Chief Data Office. And uh, talking about a uh, little bit uh, innovations, uh, um, you know, obviously we've been spending quite a lot of time and putting AI and data as a first in terms of any business initiatives that we are doing in at and um, as a good result, you know, I would say that even we partner with the uh, H2O to develop the um, AI feature store. Of course, I'll be talking about it a bit later when, um, uh, with my friends here. Um, but overall, uh, in talking about the maturity, we are doing a great job in that part of the AI journey, uh, but still we need to uh, room to grow. Um, do you want to make AI is being integrated every part of our business? Um, and really adding a lot of value to our core business. And we want to be at the fabric of the company. So that's the goal we are going towards. Uh, but we are seeing ourselves great now, I mean, in terms of scaling up uh, big time across enterprise, uh, but we want to evolve more. So that's the you know, current state of an at and and what we do in at and Great, thanks, Pr Prince. Sean, do you mind going next? Yeah, uh, Director of Analytics at AES. Um, Basically, though, I'm responsible globally for all things AI and ML at the company. We do things globally. So we're in about 13 different countries. That makes it fun with different languages that we execute with. And we do power generation, commodity. Uh, we own a few utility companies. So we're really broad in the energy industry. Lots of fun, crazy, difficult challenges. Um, it, it's exciting. It really is. I love what we do and the work that we have. When it comes from a transformation, we've been on our journey for about two and a half years, building things up from the ground. We've made a variety of mistakes, but I think we've also made some good successes. So I'd be happy to talk about those. Well, thanks for, thanks for sharing, Sean. Yeah, ideally what we'll talk about is some of the mistakes so our audience can, uh, can, can avoid those and also the successes so they can learn from some of the cool innovations and ideas you've come up with to help you know, really get AI going and, and scaling within the organization. Uh, Chris, you go next. Sure. Hi, Chris Throop. I'm a uh, Global Head of Managing Director of Data Science here at CCI. Um, similar to Sean, we are in the energy space, um, but we focus on everything from uh, not just energy, but also natural gas, petroleum, and all the derivatives. Um, so it's been an exciting summer, uh, I will say that. Um, you know, we've we've used data for, for many, many years, um, and many in the commodity space use have used data uh, for, for, for quite some time. Um, you know, we've spent the last three and a half years uh, transforming to a common platform um, and then applying AI on top of that to, to drive better business decisions. Um, historically, you know, the primary focus has been, you know, front office decisions around, you know, our natural gas plants or how we want to uh, handle the markets. Um, but we are also now currently exploring with H2O um, some of the middle and back office capabilities, um, specifically around um, document management, et cetera, because we have a lot of contracts for data, et cetera. Um, I think that one challenge that, that we face, um, and I'm sure Sean maybe faces some of the same, is you know, we bring in hundreds and, and thousands of data sets from around the world, including governments, vendors, et cetera. And so we spend a lot of time, not just on the, the data AI side of things, building that out, but also you know, getting our data curated and organized and structured uh, so that it can be properly analyzed. Uh, so that's been Kind of a joint effort an ongoing effort it's very boring work and painful but you know we're starting to see the value of it um, as we apply h2o to a variety of use cases great thanks thanks chris appreciate that we'll we'll definitely dive into it when we get well, i know we're going to talk about some challenges and i saw sean you nodding your head like full agreement about this being one of your biggest challenges uh and i hear this when i talk to a lot of our customers as well so so we'll get into that more in depth um Vinod, I know you had a couple of questions you want to jump in on, so. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, um, well, first question, since you know, the group I had uh, came to mind, you know, with the current sort of um, uh, macroeconomic, you know, climate uh, market conditions and a lot of pressures, so there's a uh, inflation being high and, you know, there's uh, fears of recession coming about. I'm just curious because, you know, in the past, I think, you know, AI was kind of like a, um, nice to have, but now I think uh, we believe that you think that AI is becoming more and more critical to help organizations uh, operate better, more efficiently, uh, maybe even like uh, be uh, smart about where they spend their money, what they do. I'm just curious, like, how are you seeing that? How are, how are you using AI or at least um, seeing the uh, economic climate impact and what, what changes are you bringing to your uh, journey? All right. Um, 
So, so you know, I would say that um, I know we are going through some sort of uh, in a tough time in an economic standpoint, but uh, the forest the AI is not a nice to have. Uh, you know, in fact, we we, we want to have AI in all the places. And um, now we inserted this AI and all the machine learning models part of our business process, uh, right from our sales. You know, uh, it's playing a huge role. You know, across AT and T, um, either it's a fraud or churn or um, you know bringing some customer insights or global supply chain management or field operations. It's everywhere. Uh, it's out there now. So it is very important for us in difficult time like this. Um, but now, in fact, even we are thinking we want to move faster, right? I mean, we want to improve our operational efficiency. Um, we want to really look at our ML operations, what how we do it. Um, and, and, and when millions of transactions have been, you know, coming through daily basis, uh, you can think of a company like an AT&T. Uh, if it is integrated part of our sales channels, you know, just taken a fraud as an example, um, there are like more than 10 million transactions every day. Uh, it's been scored in real time, you know, with the help of your H2O, um, the Mojo and, and the ML Ops and all those things that needs to really work fast. So, so uh, we are in a situation now we want to actually improve the operational efficiency and we want to move faster and we want to identify the faster patterns in real time and, uh, and, and, and go and put the new model in place. You know, either we are retraining or, or putting a new uh, model in place. Um, so that's the kind of uh, you know sentiment what we have here. Um, though you know all of the things are happening, uh, in fact it's encouraging us to you know move faster. I mean if, if we are going to fail, I mean we want to fail faster so that we can recover it and really improve our operational efficiency. Um, I'm curious, what are you, um, Chris? I know uh, from the trading side, are, are you seeing uh, headwinds, and how are you like uh, using this to change your models? Maybe that, like, you know, you always think about like the black swan events where we need to backtest our all our models or change all our models. And I'm curious, what are you doing? Yeah, so one of the reasons we chose um, going back to the beginning for H2O was, you know, we saw, um, you know, the the need for faster uh, data science. And I think um, Prince hit on it. Um, you know, we saw a changing environment. We saw that many data scientists kind of, you know, my team is, you know, people are comfortable. They write custom code, they, they use the packages, um, they investigate features, um, and it's a, it's a lengthy process. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to rapidly, like, kind of just revolutionize that, um, because as we see the market changing, we see new data sets coming to bear. Um, you know, every day there's there's new data sets, whether they're satellite based data, you know, new weather products, all kinds of different things that are happening out there. And so as we look at this kind of changing economy, we've got to be testing data and new data sets all the time to try and understand what's going to help us better predict the future. Um, and, you know, it's a real challenge. Um, you know, we're. We're, we're not at and I'm sure uh, Prince has, has a team of hundreds, if not thousands, uh, you know, or AES, um, you know, so we have a, a small team of, you know, three or four data scientists. And so we need to be highly efficient and highly reactive to what's going on in the market and, and look at things and, and, and come up with projections, impacts of inflation, in fact, you know, impacts of slowing GDP, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it is absolutely driving us to be even faster. And, and H2O is very important to, to me as part of this process because it, it truly accelerates the, uh, the feature engineering and model selection. What are you, Sean? Yeah, any thoughts? Um... I, I would be echoing both of what has been said already here. Um, you know, we, Chris went ahead and mentioned a little bit about the data challenges. I mean, I liken H2O is to the fast checkout lane in the grocery store. Okay, <laughs> going in, identifying everything that I need, and now, okay, I've got it. Let's move, um, and it, it helps enable that. Uh, you, you know, you were originally asking about the economic environment impacting the AI journey. Uh, being in the energy space, there's a lot of turmoil going on right now, a lot of changes, and I think it's going to continue changing. How we use energy is going to change, which is going to impact how responsive we and our business need to be. And um, H2O is pivotal to that. But along with, you know, dovetail what Chris said, you know, also getting people to understand the power of using a tool like this is also part of the, the transformation. And I made a, a little joke to the data scientists the other day, more of a little bit of a jab at them, because 
one of them was complaining about the business. They're like, doesn't the business see how important this is and how easy it helps them do their work? I'm like, yeah, it's kind of like getting a data scientist to figure out that H2O helps them move faster too. Nika goes, well, all right, touche, point taken. You know, um, getting them to understand that I think is important. And it, it's an evolution overall and a journey that we're all on. You know, Sean, when you say that, Sean, I'm sorry. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. But I think adoption by data scientists of a platform is one of the hardest challenges that 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 I've faced. And I'm really proud of my team because I asked them to to put aside their historical reliance on on code and coding everything and total control and trust in the platform. So it's a uh, it's been a real journey on that. It has been, and I have a data scientist, particularly with the Pythonic way of doing things that H2O has enabled outside of other tools. I mean, that helps them do the code monkey stuff that they like doing, but I've got a data scientist who loves it. He's like, every new day, I've got a new model that I get to you know, see what H2O comes up with for, for the project that we have. Um, but yeah, adoption is, is, a, is a challenge, but it's fun. Yeah, maybe if I add a little bit you know, to, to, to Sean, you said the, the adoption. Yes, one is this, you know, the platform and data scientists. And if you go a little bit north, you know, we have the business customers there, right? I mean, the domain expertise. I'll just use one example that, you know, the fraud. Um, yes, I mean, this machine learning models are, you know, scoring in real time and predicting whether it's a fraud or not. And based on the results, you know, uh, the fraud analysts to remediate the situation, uh, particular transactions with the customer, right? But, but, I mean, what is the threshold that fraud analysts should work with, right? Um, I mean, should I just use the range, uh, you know, anything about 80 percentage, uh, you know, because it's, it's a balanced activity that what you're going to give it to the customer experience as well. You don't want to annoy the customer too much because our AI is suspecting, you know, 70 percent is a fraudulent. So it's a balanced activity, but at the same time, okay, now the data science understands this, you know, AI and it's a, always a predictions. But now if you think about from the business angle, the fraud analyst, even the fraud analyst needs to adopt you know, the tool that the AI is giving me a recommendation, using that now I'm going to take some, some remediation, you know, and I want to keep the customer, you know, the frictionless experience as well. So it's a kind of a challenging, definitely, uh, when the AI is really playing in a real time, uh, in a world of a situation. Uh, but but everybody's learning. I mean, for example, I would say in this situation, what we have done, the usage to a wave. And our data scientists, you know, put together the H2O Wave app and they explained it and showed them each and every threshold, what is the value of it to our fraud analyst. The business standpoint, the fraud analyst understood those, the, the thresholds where they need to play a role because they, they, they go really tight the process. They're going to have lots of calls into the care agent. You know, they can they handle the volume. Uh, so it's kind of a balanced activity, uh, but definitely H2O, they when those sort of, uh, uh, you know, the explainable tool really helping us uh, to build a bridge between uh, the data scientists and the platform and the business community. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great one to sort of dive into maybe even more, which is, you know, what are some lessons learned for the audience as you uh, look to scale AI within your organizations? You talked about helping the data science, team, science, science teams go from, code to sort of using a platform and they still might use code as you were talking about Sean but they're using elements of the platform to help accelerate or the fast checkout lane as I think you said to move through that you know what are some things that that could help the audience say look when you're trying to operationalize AI at scale how is this going to you know what are some things they can they can avoid from a pitfall perspective that maybe you guys ran into and what are some maybe unique solutions that you came up with to um to address those pitfalls. So uh, Prince, I don't know, just to keep going on where, where, where you were, like, do you have just a, a couple points to help maybe help the audience out if they're trying to operationalize and scale AI right now? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, definitely this problem was there. I mean, just taking this AI, you know, into the business process um, in, in the scale of, like I talk about, you know, millions of transactions needs to be scored in a real time and things like that. Uh, but if I talk about a little bit of a technical challenges that what we have faced before even going there, um, you know, our data scientists, uh, we, we always say that, okay, the, the typical process is you get the data, then do the feature engineering, the magic happens, then we build the model, and then we hand it over to another team. So they're going to take the model and they're going to put it in production, right? So 
In other words, we kind of see it, uh, this process is kind of duplicated. I mean, in the sense, you're coding twice, actually, part of your training, and then part of, uh, you know, uh, the coding time. Um, so we want to avoid that. I mean, uh, we see that, uh, you know, data scientists building a model and, and, and ML engineer is kind of putting into production because uh, the data is not going to be, uh, uh, you know, clean and, and, and easy when the, during the time of your training. You know, it's not going to be the same. Uh, during the time of scoring. So uh, we definitely look at, you know, how we can avoid that sort of a problem, right? I mean, that is a one lesson to learn. Uh, we don't want to, you know, quote twice. And sometimes even we see it uh, in the same team that you have uh, two different data scientists and developing the same feature. They're working on the same variable, right? Yep. I mean, we see that duplication also happens. That's another challenge that we have seen. And, and, and always the speed to market is very important, you know, um, because like, like I, Chris mentioned in the beginning and Sean too, the data is changing, you know, before COVID, during COVID, after COVID. Um, you know, when you have, uh, if a company like AT&T, we have omni channels, you know, we have retail stores, we have digital platform and care, uh, things changes. We closed down all the retail stores during the pandemic. Okay, now the forces are taking a different pattern of things to, you know, victimize our customers. So. So this change is all happening. And at the same time, the speed that we are developing this machine learning models, and we don't want a duplication of a work, and, and, and we don't want to quote twice the same uh, you know, sort of uh, what we do. So these are all the, some of the challenges that we have seen. And, uh, and, and, and when we saw those challenges, and definitely we worked with H2O and, uh, and, 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 and been discussing, because we are you know, a big fan of the Histo Mojo, and we use various tools and technologies from you guys. And that's where the core development started happening, uh, kind of an innovation from both our side feature store, isn't it? Great, thanks, Prince. Sh Sean, what about you? You know, mis I think, I think it's, a, I mean, mistakes, you can take a look at it from like people process technology. And at the end of the day, people are make are what make things happen. And I would say for the last year when I talk with business and they, they talk about a project that they want, I say, okay, AI ML, it changes your business process. Are you ready to change? Hmm. And if they say, well, what do you mean? I said, well, let's take a look at your business uh, problem that you're trying to solve with a tool called AI ML. And trying to reframe the conversation to help them see that this isn't just something that you pull off the grocery shelf, <laughs> that it is something that you invest time, energy into, and that it requires additional subject matter experts on their team because data scientists don't know everything um, about the business side. So I think the, you know, I look at the mistakes as not engaging the business in the proper way from a people side. I think from the technology side, we did a good job of getting in data and creating data pipelines and a data lake that even the business could leverage at the same time that the data scientists are leveraging. Um, and that allowed us to bolt on technology um, to, to accelerate. And that's really what I call H2O oh, is an accelerator of, of things. And you know, then it gets into the challenges now as we're executing projects. I, I sometimes let data scientists play too much. <laughs> they experiment, that's what they love to do. So that's, that's, that's kind of how to keep them focused on the business value too with life. Um, but yeah. How have you been able to, uh, and, and Chris, I saw you nodding. So, so you, uh, maybe I'll, I'll actually throw this question to you, but like, how have you been able to bridge that divide between the business and the data scientists or improve communication? Is that like a requirements doc? Is that using things like H2O Wave to help you know, show and demonstrate and prototype? Or you know, how have you guys start, tried, you know, if that's one of the biggest problems to scaling, how have you guys tried to you know, find solutions to that that work? Yeah, so um, I, I had a list of mistakes that we'd made that was almost endless. So I'm glad you've, uh, you've, you've redirected me. Um, no, the... Uh, you know, we we've spent a bunch of time up front um, in a couple in a couple manners, and it's outside of H two O for for a lot of it, but but some of it is in H two O. First and foremost, I've aligned my team into domains, right, so that my data scientists kind of rework in the same area over and over, so they learn the content um, from our domain owners. Um, so whether it's natural gas, shipping, etc., um, I think that is is a key thing. Um, secondly, and and directly to your point. 
um, we've actually built out a, a data science portal and a data catalog all integrated into one tool set. So end users can investigate all the data products that are available. Um, they can see and put in uh, data science projects. And the point that Sean made about scope is a huge one. Um, so actually in our data science project, um, we've, we've created, we used a low code tool called Zudi to build basically a, a whole platform for this. So we have straight through processing on everything from, you know, a data subscription request all the way through to a data science project and the methodology is all instantiated in this platform. Um, and we have, we basically force the identification up front of what is the target and what is the business goal and they have to be filled in by the commercial uh, users. Um, so we've put in place process and controls to help with that. Um, and then I think when I think about H2O, some of the things that have been super helpful from my point of view, um, you know, along this process is one is the explainability, right? So we record all our Shapley scores on every run, right? So, um, you know, that's just one example of where we use the tool set to help communicate back to the commercial users. They can see the features that were impactful, they can understand, and they can help kind of QA. Um, and that's, it's just, you know, it's, it's been useful. There was one question that came up here on the side I just wanted to hit on. Somebody said, can auto ML apps make uh, data scientists lose skills? And I would actually say, at least from my experience, um, it's the exact opposite. What's happened and I've seen is that my team, instead of doing a single, simple single, single spending, you know, weeks creating a single table forecast, um, you know, that basically shows seasonality um, and growth. Instead, um, what we're able to do is push that to H2O, get that out of the way quickly, and then focus on combining multiple data sets, disparate uh, data sets, really complex problems, um, having them really focus on the hard problems. And I just want to say this, and maybe this is going to break the marketing speech that you guys are doing. So apologies in advance to H2O, because they probably shouldn't have invited me, I guess. Um, but this is not a data, this is, H2O is not a platform where you can just hand over to an end commercial user and say, hey, go do machine learning and you'll get perfect results. It is a sophisticated tool set. It's got a lot of features and bells and whistles. And that's actually what's helped with the adoption of my data, my data scientists because they, they can see how it helps them solve problems by, by tweaking the features and the, you know, the settings, et cetera. Um, so it's a, it's a very sophisticated accelerator that's really good at, at good results. It's not, it is not a, a data prep engine like Data IQ. It is not a, um, you know, a, a framework like SageMaker. It is a true auto ML and ML ops engine, um, which is exactly what we needed. That's amazing. Um, actually, on that note, there's a really interesting question from the audience. I thought that we will just ask it live to this group. Um, so the question was basically, do you think that the goal for AI in most organizations is to fully automate the decision making or is it to augment human decision making? Um, and I think um, I'm just curious because it's the line of thought you brought up, especially and Sean, you know, would love to hear your thoughts on that. I'll be happy to jump in, at least start off. Um, and, and I echo completely your sentiment there, Chris, that um, I think it matures the data scientist even more. Um, and it really embeds more passion in what they do um, by using a sophisticated accelerator like H2O. Um, you know, what is the goal for AIML in most organizations? Um, it, first, it depends on the organization. It depends on the maturity of the organization. Um, it, I truly believe that, it, it, all right, my background, I got a PhD in psychology. So you're gonna get some psychology thrown at you here. Um, <laughs> as we take a look at people and how people react in the, the evolution of work itself, um, we've always been on the way of accelerating things that we do to get to value and removing things that, um, that add non-value. And so as, as I look at AIML, there are things that are going to automate jobs, right? And that's what we call middle work. Um, but you've got low end work that's just very hands on stuff that you cannot automate away. I mean, we're still going to have construction, but can we put in their understanding and automate use AIML to make our construction projects go faster or better or be more efficient? Um, yes, we can. Can we identify pre-identify equipment failures on a construction project so that it maintains its time? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so there's things that we can do on that side. Has that replaced a human or has that actually enabled us to be more efficient at our jobs, okay? Um, and then I've got, on my side, we've got wind turbines, all right? We design models that predict failures for components on wind turbines. And a technician wakes up in the morning and they're like, what should I go look at? Right? I can never replace that technician, but I can focus him in the right direction, saying, you've got these five wind turbines, here are the probable faults that, that are occurring, or here's a potential gearbox, which for us is an expensive replacement. Go and do something so I don't have to bring in a crane that's $150,000 at the start to replace that. So it's it's more human augmentation, but I hesitate with that word. It's more human in the loop. It's it's making us be better at what we do, and you know, which with all of this information, it's helping us cogitate through things faster. It's helping us identify things. Um, I, I see it's going to be a fun evolution over the next 20, 30 years, and AI is going to be that mainstay that continues to help us be happy, do our jobs more effectively, efficiently. <laughs> It'll be just be a part of our life, like Excel is today, which we can get rid of. I don't mind. <laughs> I agree with everything except for getting rid of Excel. I love Excel. I, I have to admit it. I know, I know it's caused so many problems, but it's so great. Anyway, um, now the other thing I would just point out that it's helpful for us on um, is, you know, we're a smaller organization, you know, we have about a thousand people. And, um, you know, historically, AI has required a huge infrastructure build um, to really do its scale and prints. I'm sure you, you guys probably have quite, quite some, some servers and uh, compute capacity. One thing that, um, you know, that we're really focused on is utilization. We use Snowflake as our backend. Um, and we are very, very focused on the product innovations that Eric and his team is leading um, with the usage of Snowpark from Snowflake. Um, and it, to me, that is the future of, of, of machine learning is in database, hyperscalable infrastructure, compute infrastructure from a, from a tool set like Snowflake um, managed you know, by H2O. Um, so you know, to me, this is... Um, it's all the things that, that Sean said about kind of like making people's job higher level and, and doing more insightful analysis. It allows us to gather, you know, trillions of rows of shipping points or, or weather points or whatever, whatever the case is and, and really process them at scale. And that used to take tens of millions of dollars of infrastructure build. And, and now we're starting to see a world where we can do that um, kind of in a, in a very uh, much more attainable, ach achievable fashion without the massive infrastructure build. Um, and that's scary to some people, right? Many people have, you know, so maybe on the infrastructure team, you know, built their life on maintaining an Oracle database or servers and things like that. So you, you will face resistance with some of these visions, um, not just on the data scientists, but also potentially on your database or infrastructure teams. Um, and, you know, hopefully they get that vision of they can elevate their skills, but I don't think people always can. I don't know, Prince, you guys have massive, massive servers, I would assume. Oh, you're, you're on mute. Um, yeah, yes, Chris, I mean, sorry. Uh, I was uh, angry to whatever you said because uh, it's easy, you know, the moving to the cloud and, mm -hmm. and, and, and bringing all the data in one place. Uh, but definitely, you know, the, the cost will play a big role uh, for your computations and uh, how efficiently, you know, you, you run your queries and, uh, and, and, and manage that, you know, the workload. It's uh, really important. I mean, that's the big lesson, uh, you know, we all learned. I mean, we burned our fingers, not only in, in, in you know, in a snowflake, we use Databricks and we use Palantir. I mean, doing some strategy additions, you know, the, the evaluation of the technology, we have multiple, uh, you know, cloud, uh, you know, players in place. But, um, but, but overall, when I look at it, I mean, either I look at Palantir or I look at Databricks or I look at Snowflake, um, or even Salesforce in the science standpoint. I mean, all those things we see, uh, we don't want to duplicate the data sets in all over the, uh, the cloud. I mean, we are looking for a platform. I mean, that's another thing that why it makes a lot of sense for us to partner with the H2O is uh, to have some sort of a, you know, technology which can really work along with all these pipelines, right? Um, some people do this machine learning in Terabrake, some people do it in Snowflake, some people do it in typical Jupiter, some people doing it in Palantir, but doesn't matter. 
where you do. And as long as the data, the features that the machine learning assets that we create, that is, you know, we are able to democratize across this platform and keep it in one place and share it. And you know, that brings the, uh, uh, you know, the, the real power of a democratization. So uh, knowing this disturbance and knowing this technology, you know, evolution that we are all going through, uh, but something that we want to appreciate and 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 keep our machine learning assets in one place, and still we need to drive. You know, we don't want we want to avoid the duplication. We don't want to teach a swamp, uh, but at the same time use it efficiently. That's a big challenge, and and you know that's what we are currently you know experiencing or pretty much trying to you know get the get the job done there. Um. Well, um, I'll look at two prong question maybe, and I think uh, will lead say nicely to the next question uh, that really might yeah, I think you, know, you wanted to ask is so we have built this uh, really nice AI maturity model that uh, I know I think uh, we work very closely with AT&T and other customers as well, um, and as part of that as you know we we help customers find out where they are on the curve. So the first question for I have is um, if you were to like you know if I pose you to all three of you. Um, you have to give feedback, to, let's say someone starting new, someone from the audience says, hey, we are like really ahead, like like in the starting out in the AI maturity curve, we are like at step one or step two. How do you go about this, right? So what's like, let's say one piece of advice or a couple of pieces of advice you would give to someone to get started? Maybe I'll, I'll jump in quickly on this. So so we started this journey exactly what you said, uh, you, know, you know, we the basic thing what we have done is um, we didn't worry about the automation. You know, we didn't worry about, you know, using sophisticated tools and technology, but we started with very simple. We were like, okay, let's get the data and in a platform where we can actually, you know, do the model and show the results. So always we started with the POC, any business value that, you know, we want to just go in front of the business and say that, hey, AI can bring some value. So, but we always go with, start with the POC and do a POC and do the show and tell and show the value, the value, say the cost avoidance or cost savings, you know, what are the value that's going to bring it and, and then show that. And that really helps uh, the leadership or it's kind of a change in the culture, right? In, our, in, in the company, you know, people we've been working on uh, a different enterprise style of, you know, making things happen, it's pretty much rules driven, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, uh, logic driven approach, but you're know, again, getting into the predictive side of it. So really what it helps is doing a simple POC, do the show and tell and make the literature understand and 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 then you know go there uh, from uh, from from the POC. So that's what really helped us. And we have done many POCs, I would say, in the beginning of our uh, you know in, in chief data office um, across various views. But um, I can see the results now after the fact we did all this good work, but now we are really in the curve of uh, you know the maturity model to get into the evaluation side. No, it's great. Thanks, Prince. Chris? Well, I, I agree with everything Prince said. We did uh, POCs. Um, actually, we, we made a mistake there. Uh, we showed too much value. And so some things were done too quickly. And so people just assumed, oh, well, data science can all be done now in two days. Um, so, you know, it was kind of ironic um, that we actually oversold actually internally. Um, it's with the POC process, but that's a whole different discussion. Um, you know, I think a couple of thoughts. Um, you know, one thing that... Uh, you know, I had my team lay out um, end to end was a methodology and process, and we instantiated that through a tool. Um, I mentioned that earlier. Um, so if you're getting started, you have to start with the data, um, and you also have to start with a methodology and governance model. Um, and the problem with this is it sounds great, and if you meet with commercial leadership and they say we're going to prioritize, um, this all sounds great. And if you start with the data and you get good quality data and you're properly tagged and, and organized and good data quality, um, and you do all these things, um, and then you build a methodology. It all it's great, and it, it it solves some of the problems around too much exploration, et cetera. The other challenge, though, it creates though is um, your business users may feel disenfranchised. So they may never make it to the very top of the priority list for the data science function for the team um, to work on. Um, you know, we don't have unlimited capacity. So you know, what we've done by documenting all this is we've a few people are very frustrated because their projects never get to the top of the list. Um, so, you know, thinking about a hybrid engagement model where maybe two thirds of the team is focused on strategic um, projects and then one third of the team is focused on tactical point in time, you know, re really rapid market, you know, things setting 
working with commercial leadership to set aside kind of capacity in that fashion, um, I think can be helpful because as good as the tool is to accelerate the analysis, there's always more, there's always more to do. Um, and so prioritization is important. So I think that's the lesson we learned along the way is that we, we built a platform, we had a platform approach, you know, my data scientists push all data engineering into, you know, views, we use machine learning views, we don't use, you know, code uh, to transform. We did, all, I think, a lot of things right, but we also didn't necessarily be as responsive to all of our commercial users, and that caused some frustrations, some real frustrations. <laughs> That's a great, thanks Thanks for sharing that, Chris. Sean, Sean what about you? Like, what, what helped you guys really get, get going and then scale uh, um, with AI? It, I, I think, you know, we, we started at least with the data. You know, if somebody had asked me today, how do you, how, I'm a new, co I'm a company and how do I start my AI ML practice? I've never done it before. This is brand new. Part of me wants to say, don't design a model for 12 months. Okay. <laughs> start off talking about it, advertising it, get the foundation set up, which is how are you going to run your compute? How are you going to create your endpoints? Where's your data? What's doing, you know, start bringing all of that in, start working with all the DBAs, get them in from a, an infrastructure level to start pulling that data in and then start creating some models. Because to Chris's point, as soon as you give them candy, they want more candy. And sometimes these guys are kids in a candy shop and saying, let's do this and let's do this. Or, can you do that? Yeah, we can. That's going to take five months. That may take a month, you know. Um, and then you're, you're pausing sometimes because you're, you're stuck on the data side. Uh, I, I always have a hesitation with governance. The, the, the wording I like to use is minimum viable governance. Back to the point that, that Chris was making is that you can get disenfranchised um, business people, which is not what you ever want to have happen when you're doing this because then they start doing their own shadow AI ML. Um, and that I almost fear is more destructive than a shadow IT department. So, um, you know, how do you, how do you help keep that engagement? Um, you know, one thing that I that I, we did at the very beginning was we created design thinking sessions. And so we went to the business and said, we're going to just talk for four hours about your problems. And they just talk about them. I said, okay, that is good. That is not, that works. And then we just talk about some value and some timing. And we talk about creating expectations. So it's a lot of conversations in the beginning. And now every 12 to 18 months, we hold a design thinking session with the group and they all love coming to it because we get to discuss things and talk about prior successes and where we are. And then here's all the new things on the horizon. But at the same time, it's how do you and help enable some people who, um, who aren't getting that feedback. And one of the, the things that we've been doing on our maturity, I would say is I call it enabling or I call them Python enabled people. All right, we're getting more people into the workforce that can leverage and use Python, but they're not data scientists, but they can do some things with Python. So how do you help enable them for some of the simple things that they may be doing, but that also helps elevate their the maturity overall. And it also helps identify people who have good potential to upskill in data science inside of a company. You know, we're not even talking about finding data scientists. That's a whole other panel discussion in and of itself. <laughs> It's probably a good one. Uh, we actually had a blog recently on just hiring and retaining data science talent come out because it is such a such a topical issue. You know, just sort of going back into the the POC concept, Prince and and Chris. I know you're talking about you know your first your first project adding so much value. You know, this is something um, I've seen talking to a lot of our customers is you know they really start uh, by getting the first few lighthouse wins that really actually show value is what's helping them scale. You know, is it, do you feel like there's a number? Like, is that like two or three? Like how many projects do you think you need to like really have that business value in to really help the organization say, oh yes, we need to make a much bigger or faster investment uh, into AI ML to really help drive the business. Is, can you do that with just one project or is it typically like a small handful? Yeah, I think it's, it starts with always you know, you know one project and uh, and 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 it's like you know I will tell you it's not necessarily the first project needs to be a you know super predictive model uh, or or a beautiful forecasting model or some optimization problem you are trying to solve it could be you know finding a needle in a haystack problem okay so um, so it's not necessarily you know uh, you know how big of the problem you are trying to solve. Uh, it's all about, you know, uh, like like Sean mentioned, Chris mentioned. I mean, data is also it's a, plays a very important role, right? So so if you can able to get like three months history of data, like 
multiple data sets and then join them and bring some features and then build some model on that. So do something that's small and uh, show the value. And once you get the value, then people are, you know, seeing the candy and then obviously they want more candies. Like, uh, and then you kind of dictate the terms and say, okay, you know what, in order for me to do that, I need more data sets to coming in. Yep. You know, the, it's, a, it, it's like three months it's taking to build a model. And, um, and, but of course, once you have more data coming in place, definitely the, 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 you know, building the model and the lifetime is reducing it. And, and the tools like H2O, what we, you know, use it, right? Um, uh, I would, I would, you know, I, like I always say that if I'm a big fan of uh, H2O Mojo, um, you know, because you guys made us to run these models in production. Um, it's not an experimentation, right? We are running these models in production. So we need to run these models in 60, you know, milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 500 milliseconds. So that's the sort of a speed we need it. So you're not going to do that speed while you're doing this uh, POC, but our data scientists focused on building those models that use the H2O technology where we can scale that, you know, POC to production in, in, you know, quite reasonable. And I would say sometimes it's, it's much faster. I mean, we are able to, you know, take to the model very fast to the production now. So, um, so yeah, I mean, and start with the one model, show the value, you get more candies, then ask them more in terms of the data and the assets that you want. And with the help of tools like H2O, you know, then we can scale it up to the bigger level. You know, related to that, Chris, you know, you talked about that one, you know, you had that use case that had this super, you know, strong value to get started. Like, how did you select that use case? You know, I think that's an area where a lot of people struggle, which is, you know, how, how do you, with those get your know, ones to get started, how do you get the right business problem to start with to know that you can then bring that up to leadership and start building the function? That's where, um, you know, you have to have, I think as a head of a state data science group, you have to have strong relationships back to your commercial owners. So I went through a process of talking to each of them and finding out what was kind of the, the areas uh, where there was a pain point um, and where I could find an intermediate size problem. I didn't want them something that was so simple that everyone would look and say, well, that's, that's no big deal. Why should we spend money on this? We can use open source packages to solve this problem. On the other hand, I didn't want a multi-year or a multi-month um, project that would take you know, six months um, to assess. So, so we really spent a little bit of time talking to the commercial owners um, and then figuring out our model. And the other part that was you know, good about this is, or I would talk about a little bit about is how we communicated the results. So what we actually did in this POC is we did, we, we, we took, I had one of my data scientists do the project and measure all their time in JIRA. Um, then we took four different platforms and we assessed them and we had the, the same project done and we actually did the timings through the different platforms. Um, and then we also looked at the actual RMSE um, to compare actual results and accuracy. Um, and H2O, um, as I said before, came out extremely well on the automation of the feature engineering and the model. Um, and you know, it was the only platform uh, with those features that came out with an RMSC that was basically the same um, as my data scientist could do on, uh, on his own. Um, so that was a pretty incredible result. But then going back to take the, the POC back, what we did, we created several different decks. Um, for, our, for our COO, we created the time savings and efficiency deck. Uh, for, for, our, for our sophisticated commercial users who have a technical mindset, uh, we showed Shapley scores. For our commercial users who only under, you know, are, are more Excel type and um, you know, really more fundamental in their, their skill sets, um, you know, we actually created visualizations which showed visually how much closer the forecasts were um, versus um, existing existing work that had previously been done. Um, so, you know, we really prepared multiple messages off of the same work product, um, and that was tailored to the commercial needs. But it was there was a fair amount of time and needed to to go communicate. And I, you know, because I always get the pressure. Well, why do we spend money on a platform? I could just go hire another um, data scientist for the same cost, right? That was a real question internally. And we have all this free open source. I've read about this. Why, you know, our CEO is like, I've read about this open source revolution, why can't I just go do that? Um, so, you know, I really had to show the, the value of the platform in terms of end to end process, not just engineering and, or, or not just, uh, but the ML ops side as well. Um, so those were all messages that I had to listen for my commercial leaders and then prepare uh, communication to. Right, no, thanks for that. I think that's a really common 
um, challenge that many, many companies have getting started is that communication piece. So that's a great, that's a great insight. Um, you know, I think one of our mistakes is that we weren't able to find the right t-shirt size project to work on. Um, so our projects were nine to 12 months which was a little bit longer than, than what was needed. I think it needs to be a little less than six months, but it's okay, I would say, to show value iteratively, all right? Because, you know, we had one project where, you know, the, the business was doing about 65% on accuracy. We came in, we moved it up to 70%. I'm like, hey, that's a little bit more. You know, does that prove that we can show, you know, we know we can improve that. All right, we had a strategy behind that and it slowly got the business involved. I mean, sometimes you're not gonna have these big whammies. So you've got to go for smallness, but you know, as you, as you posed your question there, Reed, I think what's important to note, I'm gonna go back to my psychology side here, is that business can only change so fast. And we did something successful with one business unit and they said, okay, we wanna do this. And I said, but you're not done actually working fixing out or, you know, figuring out what we did on how to implement it. No, <laughs> go spend three months doing what we already gave you. Then let's go talk. And they were a little bit miffed at it, but three months they came back and I said, okay, tell me how you, ha what happened over your three months? They're like, well, thank you. You know, we actually spent time using it. Now we know what we want on this next iteration more so than we thought we did. Um, it's important to keep in mind that we're humans. We can only change so fast. If I give a business five projects in a year, I'm going to overwhelm them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a balance to play in this. And it's nice that I can move fast, but you, you need to work on how to, you know, keep this holistic with the organization. No, it makes sense. Sorry. Um, and I'll be almost on time, but then we'll, uh, we'll close out with one question for everyone. Um, what's next? What's the next uh, innovation that you guys are working on? Maybe you can share a sneak peek of uh, something cool that you're working on. Sean, I think I uh, know um, uh, you've been doing some really cool stuff with like drones, uh, streaming video from drones to do like improve, like, you know, predictive maintenance and stuff. Uh, I don't know if you have something you're um, happy to share or maybe something cooler you're working on, maybe the same for others as well. Um, you know, you want to talk about innovation, where we're going, um, how do we use graph DBs and integrate them more? Um, I think that's important. There's a lot of relational things going on inside the data. How do we leverage that? Um, drone data has been fun. I'm actually excited more about satellite data on what can be done. Um, satellite data can actually reduce drone data costs. There's a variety of things out there that that are the technology is being coming more available where the resolution is there that you can get it. And, you know, honestly, for 20 grand, I can start tasking some satellites to do stuff. That's not a big number for, for our organizations in, in testing and trying new things. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Cool. Uh, Chris Prince. You know. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. So, yeah, for us, the innovation are part of our AI maturity model, right? I mean, we are in a phase where how we can democratize the AI across our enterprise, right? I mean, internally, we run a program called AI as a service. Um, so definitely, you know, that's why we figured it out in order to scale such a big level. And uh, when I say the democratized AI, it's not just uh, our data scientists and data engineers just using from the platform standpoint, but it's more like how uh, citizen data scientists in, in our business people can really use the AI, part of their day-to-day -day operations, right? So that's the journey that we are you know, going through and definitely the innovation there, um, a core development you know, with your team on H2 or Feature Store. Um, that's really a big one for you know both of us, and um, we are we are putting a lot of our efforts to innovate that product, and really you know help us to take to the the journey that uh, you know what we are going on. That's that's from our side. Okay. And I think from our side, um, you know, unstructured data is very very interesting. Um, I've wasted a lot of my time of my life on NLP projects in the past, um, so you know I'm hoping. Um, that with some of the new tool sets out of H2O, uh, maybe we can start to, to explore that truly as a, as a value add um, versus a time suck. Um, so that's one area I think that we're going to explore. Um, secondly, 
um, as I mentioned, uh, we're, we're obviously investigating middle and back office uh, use cases where I think there's some data anomaly detection. I think we don't have a retail focus that maybe like Prince might have. So we, we don't have uh, fraud, but we have, we have other potential uses, I think, there, maybe in terms of you know, uh, glitches from our brokers or, or whatever. Um, and then really third, I would say the, the, the biggest and most important focus for us in terms of innovation is, and I mentioned it earlier, is creating the most scalable um, platform possible, right? Um, because as I said, we're a somewhat smaller organization. I mean, I'm sure AT&T has like a thousand people just in one call center. Um, so, you know, we, we are, you know, much smaller. And so we need to take the tool sets that we use, which is Snowflake and H2O. We need to use them together um, and use them to attack larger and larger data problems. Is like Sean, we're in the internet of things, right? The real world, the world, the world of commodities is all about the real world. And so, as you can imagine, there's almost endless data uh, in the real world um, that, that can be pulled in. So these abilities to take on larger and larger data sets without kind of a huge cost infrastructure build is a core focus of ours. Um, and, and really, frankly, um, when we compared, uh, not to sell H2O, but when we compared H2O to some of the other um, different products out there, um, you know, we saw that tightness of partnership and utilization, maximum utilization of of, of of the new upcoming feature sets within Snowflake. Um, so that was a big decision point for us uh, last year. Thank you. Um, uh, I think we are at the top of the hour. Um, I really want to thank, take the time to opportunity to thank Chris, Sean, and Prince for joining us for this amazing panel. It was a great discussion. I think, yeah, and some great questions as well. I think the audience was super engaged. Uh, a lot of questions. We'll definitely try to answer those questions offline or uh, maybe even after the panel. But um, uh, once again, thank you for joining us, sharing your insights. Um, this was fun as uh, always. And um, uh, I hope you'll stick around for the rest of the hour uh, where we are going to talk about some of the product innovations and share some of the new innovations that are coming up as well. Okay. Thank you all. Um, and then um, uh, Prince, if you want to stay on for a bit, uh, we can talk about feature story real quick. Uh, that's one of the first things in the product innovation. Thanks, and then Chris, um, thanks, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Chris. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and kick it off. All right, so we got a fun agenda coming up, a bunch of new products, um, like our existing products, new innovations on those products. We'd start off at Feature Store, obviously go to Hydrogen Torch, Document AI, h 2 i Cloud, of course, um, h 2 Wave, uh, Remolops, uh, Responsible AI, and then we'll get to h 2 3 um, So we got new innovations, we got PMs waiting, uh, ready to share some of the new innovations on all those different products. Um, to kick it off, just maybe start by telling you what we've done in the last sort of year, year and a half, right? So um, we've been in this journey um, for, you know, or 10 years now, but in the last year and a half, we've announced phenomenal, like a set of new innovations, right? So we launched H2AI Cloud um, uh, actually early last year. So it's basically a year and a half for the platform, right? So this entire platform, of course, um, we have had driverless AI, H203, Sparkling Water and Steam, all these products um, customers have loved and used for many years, but we brought them all together into AI Cloud. Um, and then we had basically 100 plus apps in the app store as well, very quickly. Um, we followed it up with Feature Store, which was which went live in Q3 of last year, a uh, joint announcement with AT&T, with Princess Team. We also launched Travelers AI 110, which was a big release, phenomenal, ton of improvements, ton of uh, new innovations there. Um, uh, late in the year, uh, we launched our managed cloud, which was a big announcement as well. This is the first time we have a basically a, a software as a service uh, solution, the entire AI cloud fully managed by us. Um, so it's a turnkey solution for customers to come in and start using it. We also launched a whole bunch of health apps for our health app store. In Q1 of this year, we uh, announced Document AI, which is also a co-innovation with one of our other customers, UCSF, um, that uh, you probably saw a webinar early in the year. Um, we also la we launched Hydrogen Torch in Q1 of this year, which is a no-code deep learning platform. We have a lot of innovations coming, updates coming on that as well. And then we upgraded our ML ops. So this was all um, in the if you, if you attended our last product day, which was in April, you've probably caught a lot of these things. 
So what's coming up, right? Um, we have a, a phenomenal set of things that we're going to talk about today, but more importantly, we are also introducing things like labeling. We have a feature store going more generally available for customers. Document are becoming generally available. Managed cloud with more tiers, uh, AutoML as a service. We can also have more tooling for business users to make it really easy for them to consume the platform. Uh, we have a lot of app tool building toolkits, um, uh, which we'll showcase a little bit later, like how making it really easy to build more apps um, and have them available on the platform. Okay. So stay tuned for the entire rest of the year. Our uh, we'll cover a lot of these things. I want to start off with Feature Store first. Um, this is uh, a product that we announced uh, late last year um, in partnership with at and um, especially uh, Prince uh, and team. We've been working on this, uh, so well, actually more than a year and a half, right? Like almost two years of uh, uh, working closely with the team. Um, the, uh, we got a lot of uh, phenomenal uh, requirements, like very uh, core requirements where uh, like we, we understood what data centers were doing at scale, what, uh, what challenges at and was facing when they were launching all these models uh, with all these uh, data sets that were being powered, uh, that are powering these models. Um, and Prince mentioned earlier, right? Like the key was to ensure that the same data that is uh, used for training is made available for inferencing um, at a really low latency. So uh, with that challenge in mind, we set out to build this, this feature store. Um, as you can see, one of the key tenets for us all along was to ensure that data can come from anywhere. Um, you know, we uh, earlier Chris mentioned how Snowflake is a key uh, data store for them. Uh, data Indy, Snowflake, Databricks, and all the other tools that exist as well. We also saw that customers have data in, let's say, uh, environments like Teradata and Palantir and other places. So we built a whole bunch of pipelines. So the key was to bring in data from wherever you are, whether it's real-time data sources or batch data sources. Uh, we have connectors for all of those different data sources. So you can bring in data to the feature store from wherever they are. Wherever your feature engineering pipelines exist or your data transformation pipelines exist, you can just use the same pipelines to bring in data to the feature store. And once it's in the feature store, we have the offline and online store to support for uh, batch predictions or model training and then online for the real-time predictions. And more importantly, we have a full metadata registry which allows us to keep all the historical information about the features, like information about audits, like lineage, uh, where was the data created. Uh, and, and this is critical for discovery purposes. So one of the big values of feature store is you don't just create a feature pipeline once, you reuse it again and again. So if someone has created an amazing feature and put it into production, uh, how nice would it be if others can benefit from that without having to recreate the wheel? So the metadata becomes critical to help expose, help uh, discovery and collaboration of the features. Chris, you want to add a few comments and uh, how it's been working out and what, what's the journey been at at and Sure, sure. I mean, I mean, you know, you know, you nailed it. I mean, you kind of mentioned all the key functionalities or some of the challenges that we had in, 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 in the past and how really the feature store is solving those problems. Uh, it's awesome, right? So, so like uh, you know, we mentioned, we launched this in at and internally. Uh, we have more than thousand data scientists and data engineers out in this platform. We have more than you know ten thousand features has been in our feature store across different BU. We have features coming from different you know the BU like global supply chain fraud and and customer insights and and then I mean it's happening you know uh, really a big time right now. So. The whole purpose is how we can reuse these features and how we can you know, minimize that, you know, the offline online challenge and uh, how fast we can go, right? I mean, a new problem comes in, um, you know, let me go and, and, and research what features that I have in Feature Store. Quickly go and look at it. I see a couple of feature sets has been posted by someone else, uh, but really it's useful. Let me combine that and see, oh yeah, I got a good look to my existing model or I'm able to put a new model quickly. You know, is, is there is a already, you know, two, three great success stories uh, with at and um, using this feature store. So uh, it's a nice collaboration. And I love the daily standup that uh, in our team is doing with uh, Vinod and H2O team there uh, in order to do this, uh, you know, code development on a daily basis. So it's a really a great journey. And we see a lot of, uh, uh, you know, return of investment already for this feature store uh, and looking forward to, you know, enrich more functionalities and, and really doing that magic that what we are looking for with the feature store uh, part of our AI as a service. Thank you, Prince, absolutely. So uh, with that, let me just jump ahead and show a very quick demo of how the feature store actually works and how you can use it. Uh, 
All right, so if you come to the feature store, this is the, the front end for the feature store. This is the user interface where uh, users can come in. Um, it's a nice way to look at all the projects you have in on place. You can also look at all the feature sets and um, there is also a full access control mechanism. We have a full permissioning workflow. So when you create a feature set or a project, you can, um, it's, it, it, it has different tiers and people can try and see who can have access to it, right? Um, the nice thing is that once the project is created, you can go into the project, you can see the individual feature sets that are inside the project. You can pick one of them and you can open it and you get a whole bunch of details about the feature set, right? It tells you uh, when it was created, uh, who it was created by the pipeline itself, processing interval, uh, other information like time to live and et cetera. So these are all things that can be tracked. One important thing is you can also uh, track um, or at least uh, carve out features to be whether they are uh, they have PCI data or, or SPI data or special data, right? This is important because if you all want your data to be if it is sensitive, you want to track it so that others cannot see the raw values, even if they can see the actual feature set itself. Um, and that's something that's supported out of the box with the feature store. And once you see the list of features, you can obviously go and peek into them. Uh, you can get some summary statistics very quickly, like uh, mean, medians, et cetera, accounts. And this is useful, again, to see the data, like get a sense of what the data shape of the data looks like. We are adding some more innovations over here. So coming soon, we can actually generate an auto insights report for you and have it available. So that's nice because that entire report can be used for uh, user again to uh, get a sense of what the data looks like, right? Um, there is uh, uh, the ability to add quotes uh, artifacts. So this is nice because you can uh, have a report or maybe sometimes you can have like a, a PRD attached to the project itself. The, the, so let's say a data scientist built a really great set of features. They can put in additional information that'll help others determine if that project is useful for them. So you can add uh, links, PDFs, et cetera. You can also get a code snippet. This is nice because you can essentially create, take the, Py, the PySpark or Python code you need to go connect to the client and then use the feature set from the client, which is how you will most commonly use it, right? So if you go to, let's say, your Spark environment or your Python environment, you can just pick up this code and start using it. And that's what we'll do today, right? We'll very quickly show you how you will interact with the feature store, right? So if I go to my Jupyter environment, a little bigger. Um, you come in, you'll see basically this is a notebook I have where I've already installed the feature store client um, and I've already logged into the feature store. So it's very easy. You use your auth token, you can log in. Um, if you use Jupyter, it's it's super simple to log in. It'll, this will pop up essentially a new window that will help us, um, whether you're um, you're using Azure Auth or uh, AWS Auth, what are your auth mechanism, you go and log in and authenticate yourself. Once that is done, you can then come in as a user and you can do a few things. You can obviously read data sets. You can extract the schema. You can use that to create a, a new feature set, register the feature set, schema as a feature set, and then ingest data into the feature store. So this is your canonical workflow. If you're a data scientist, you built a great model and you have a great set of features. You want to then supply, like put that, publish that feature set into the feature store. And this is how you would do it. You basically do that, right? So you would ingest your data, you read the source file, um, you would run it, uh, basically uh, bring up your credentials and then you would extract the schema. This is the key part. Once you extract the schema, uh, you can also then, this is the opportunity for you to specify whether certain fields are, um, are sensitive. So in this case, I'm saying that, hey, gender is a sensitive field. I'm marking it as a PCI field, right? Um, that means that it's going to be masked by default. Uh, it's easy for you to then change it later, but this is how we start off, right? Once that's done, you then go create a project. In this case, I created a project called Vinod Demo. Um, and in that project, I can then register the feature set. Uh, as I do that, I have the, also the opportunity to register ingest data into the feature set. Um, and by default, the data will be ingested into the offline store. But just as easy it is to register the data into the online store as well. So this is how you determine whether you want the data to be in, uh, online or offline. And this is a call you may make based on your application requirements and stuff. And once the data is ingested into both offline and online, super easy to retrieve it. So you can, as a user, can come in and start retrieving it. So in this case, I'm just going to try and retrieve the data from the, uh, we're going to do the offline in a minute, but I'm going to do the online example. So, sorry. Cars of the live demo. <laughs> for some reason. But um, this is the command to do the retrieve. It will retrieve and then quickly show you basically um, the payload. You can see the actual payload that was retrieved and um, this retrieval can happen in like milliseconds, right? So because we are using a really fast online store, you can get the data uh, out in milliseconds and, and you can have some millisecond latency if you need to, depending on the uh, requirement of the model. 
But once the data is in here, I can now do something interesting. I can go to something uh, or my, a tool like driverless AI, or for that matter, you can use Spark or some other tool. And you can just go directly and connect to the feature store. Uh, you go and select the project you are looking for. In this case, I'm going to use the Winot demo project. And within that project, you can go look at the feature sets that are available, right? So what are features that you want, pick it and start using it. Uh, in this case, I already ingested the data. So let me just go ahead and show you. So the data will show up over here once you click ingest. That means that the data has been retrieved uh, and pulled into the into the travel CI instance. And now I can operate just like any other um, data set. I can then do details on it. I can look at the rows. I can build models off of it and so on. And once I build the model and deploy it to product, I'm ready to deploy it to production. I can use the same online store to score it, right? So my MLOps uh, instance can basically call uh, features from the online store, score the results uh, with our, my uh, model and then deploy it, right? So all this can be done very seamlessly. One other nice thing you could do is, let's say you built a model in Driverless AI, and uh, as you are familiar, Driverless AI not just uh, builds your great model, it also does feature engineering for you. It can create some really nice features for us. In this case, it's creating like an interesting feature, cross validated time uh, target encoding, or maybe it's something else that's you find useful. You can use the Mojo to publish the features back into the feature store. So if you have some really nice features created by Driverless AI, you can um, put them back into the feature store. And basically that becomes a new pipeline. You create a new pipeline that will publish features into the feature store. Okay. So that was a very, very quick overview of the, what, the, what the feature store does. This is again available in our AI cloud. It's available. It's gonna be available very soon in our managed cloud as well. So if your customer wants to try it out, let us know. We'd love to uh, do a POC and like show you how it can help you in your AI journey. Any last thoughts, uh, Prince, on this? Uh, Prince, you're on mute. Okay. Sorry, uh, one point you mentioned about, you know, you've shown the demo of the Jupyter notebook. Um, it can work the same CLI functions across, you know, any, pla any, any ML pipeline, right? I mean, whether you are in Snowflake, whether you are in uh, Databricks, uh, or you know Palantir or Salesforce, like it could be any pipelines. Uh, the CLI just makes life easier from feature store, and uh, we use the same piece of code all the time, and um, and it really works. So you can, for example, you can create these features, you know, being in Jupyter pipeline. Let's say, but your scoring pipeline is completely different. Let's say in Snowflake. But still, you can use the same features, you know, uh, using the online feature store or even offline feature store, you know, at the time of the scoring. So that's why it's kind of a work across all these tools and technology, but keeping all this in one place. And another point that I would also mention is that the data privacy and compliance, because this feature store is, is you know, democratizing these features across different views in your enterprise. Uh, but at the same time, it is also well handled in terms of the data encryption and, and security about these features and, um, and then also the, the PCI, RPI and SPI information. And, um, and, and there is a little bit of an internal you know, process that you want to do it, right? I mean, a company like AT&T Forest, it's, it's very important, the data privacy and, and compliance and, 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 and even the ethics of uh, this AI. So. Um, you know, that's also been uh, baked inside this feature store. That's why it makes life easier. It's just a one place and, and, and really helping us bringing the data scientists, our data analysts, and our business people, and the lawyers and legal, everybody in one place, but uh, it's centralized and it can be reused. So, um, so that's, the, that's the power of our feature store here, and that's how it's helping AT&T to democratize uh, the AI across the enterprise. Yeah. And then Prince, I think, um, I don't know if you can share this, but um, uh, just talk about scale, right? Like I think at, at AT&T, uh, I don't know if you're able to share how big of, the, how, how many feature sets you mentioned, you know, a lot of features with like just from the size of data, how much you're loading up. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a different, uh, in our teams, they are bringing the data um, in different sizes, right? I mean, it's sometimes I would say, if I want to just maybe quote, not necessarily internal at and data, but we also get, you know, data from external. And uh, we could able to load, you know, uh, two two terabytes of a data, uh, like in, in in the form of the features. Like there are like two and two hundred features and two terabytes of a data. We could be able to load it in thirty minutes of a time into the feature store, right? That is a one thing I would say in offline data ingestion into feature store standpoint. The another one during the the online scoring, we want uh, you know the feature lookups at runtime. 
uh, during the scoring time in less than 50 milliseconds. So that's also happening, right? Um, so it's happening both the sides. I mean, whether you're going with a big volume or um, how fast you want to retrieve the feature. So, uh, so that's the you know that's the good numbers I would say uh, considering yep. um, in, a, in a big uh, uh, ML operations. Yeah, no, I think speed and performance are the key, right? That's the fundamental currency. Like that's the right. like, it, it is all bells and whistles, but their core is need to be able to handle large volumes of data, scale, and then uh, performance, right? So in terms of speed, right, and uh, right. being able to retrieve the features as fast as possible uh, as required for a particular application. So uh, thank you, Prince, Absolutely. for taking the time again to join us. It was, uh, as always, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. And you know, uh, your uh, insights are very valuable for everyone. I'm sure the audience as well enjoyed your run. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank cool. you. Um, with that, I'm going to bring up some of the other innovations we have. Let me go to my slides. So um, I'm going to call upon Dimitri Gordiev, uh, who's our uh, who's a uh, Kangaroo Grandmaster and Senior Data Scientist, who's also the lead for uh, PM for our uh, Hydrogen Torch product. So I'll let him uh, come up to stage and present. Over to you, Dimitri. Uh, thank you, Vinod. Let me start with sharing my slides. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, H2 Hydrogen Torch, and we'll focus um, more on the new features which we have worked on uh, over the past few months. But let me start with um, a few words about what Hydrogen Torch uh, it is, uh, is, and uh, just to get everyone on board for those who haven't worked with it or haven't seen it yet. H2 Hydrogen Torch is our deep learning engine, uh, as it was mentioned, it's a no code engine. So it is designed for, uh, for junior data scientists, first of all. So for those who don't have much experience in deep learning to be able to deliver uh, state of the art, a world-class deep learning models very fast, as well as we also aim at the audience of some senior uh, computer vision engineers with a very uh, heavy functionality we built in into Hydrogen Torch and we continue to add um, every quarter. With, um, with Hydrogen Torch at hand, uh, uh, we are enabling our users to solve their own deep learning use cases. So we start from ingesting the data uh, and all the way to the business application uh, uh, of, of, of your uh, particular use case. So um, uh, we start from consuming the data and enable the data scientists to set up the problems, to set up the, to choose the model architectures, to uh, set hyperparameters, tune the hyperparameters and make the best out of it. So not only build a predefined model, but also to make uh, the most accurate mo model possible given, given the data and the, um, and the, um, limitations in terms of how large the model can be. Um, data scientists can inspect the results, evaluate the models, get some insights about how the models work and how do they make predictions, retrain the models uh, whenever needed, and of course, seamlessly deploy to our H2ML ops, uh, which is running on AI cloud or any other Python environment of choice. As soon as the model is deployed, uh, we can it can uh, run on on, on the hardware of your choice, uh, of your choice. So we're, uh, we, uh, we care a lot about the latency here as well. So it can support some real-time applications as well. And you can consume it either through wave, uh, uh, wave apps or your own UI interfaces, or you can just uh, use the REST API calls and integrate deep learning models directly into your backend or front-end systems. Um, with deep learning, we'll focus on the types of the applications where deep learning shines the most, uh, namely unstructured data. So we start with, uh, uh, with textual uh, applications, uh, NLP tasks with computer vision, which, uh, which is applied to images and videos. But we don't stop there. We're going to grow a number of unstructured data types we can consume and we can uh, build deep learning models for. Right now, we focus on uh, not only images and text, but we also introduced uh, audio as another type of the input. Um, I'll mention, uh, I'll, I'll talk more about it in a bit. 
But I want to emphasize that unlike typical classical uh, machine learning, where we focus usually on classification and regression, in deep learning, we have actually a way wider range of the problems we are solving. Um, it is caused by the fact that the models can sometimes um, output the full text or images or detect uh, something in the text or images or in audio. So there is like the whole range of uh, problem types that you can solve with deep learnings, which go far beyond typical classification and regression. And as you can see from the slide, we cover a lot of those. Um, I believe we cover all the most typical, most common types of the use cases. But of course, this list is not, um, not uh, it. We will be adding more and more uh, driven, by, uh, driven by requests from our customers and uh, and the use cases we see out there. Um, not limiting by, by computer vision and uh, NLP, we're also adding, we've also added audio support, but of course we'll be adding more and more types of the data as well. Um, uh, let me talk a little bit more about the audio functionality, which you can find in Hydrogen Torch now. Uh, we've added support of audio classification, audio regression tasks to Hydrogen Torch. So you can upload your audio recordings to the tool and run deep learning models uh, and build uh, state-of-the-art classification and regression models. What we do um, is actually quite, uh, quite an interesting approach, which, which has proven to be state-of-the-art approach in the competitive environment. So, that's how the best audio uh, deep learning models built these days. We convert the audio into, uh, you see it on the right hand side, into the spectrograms, um, which are nothing else but images. And we apply computer vision models actually to audio data. That brings us uh, many benefits. First, we apply the best neural network architectures out there because they're well designed and tuned for computer vision tasks. Second, we do transfer learning, which allows you to build better, more accurate models with less data. And third, we can apply all the computer vision techniques like data augmentations and so forth to get the most out of the limited data set you might have at hand. Um, one of the new features uh, you might find in the new release of Hydrogen Torch is deep learning interpretability. That's an extra functionality we're adding to multiple types of the, uh, of the tasks. Um, basically, we, uh, at the moment, we cover all three, uh, NLP, computer vision, and audio analysis with it. So for NLP tasks, uh, for your models, you will be also able to see not only predictions, but also word importance. So which words in the text drove the predictions? That would help you analyze uh, what drives the model, how the model works. So that will give you not only the flavor of how a uh, model behaves, but also can, uh, can be helpful if, um, if you apply this technique to each individual predictions. So with a prediction, you will not only see what the model believes, believes in the true prediction, not only the, not, uh, the confidence, but also uh, kind of an explanations, which words, which phrases are, are uh, the drivers of the decision made by the model. Uh, a similar uh, approach with a completely different technique is applied to computer vision tasks. Uh, here uh, you see um, a very simple example of a machine learning model, uh, of a deep learning model uh, classifying pictures of flowers. And here we apply a technique called grad cams, which um, also highlights the areas of the image which drove the prediction made by the model. So which areas of the model, uh, which areas of the, of the image are important um, case by case. And that at first, uh, first of all, um, helps to validate the model in terms of uh, making sure that the model focuses on the things which are important for us. So we see here that the sunflowers are recognized based on the sunflowers and not the background of the images or something which is uh, clearly unimportant. So the model is actually learning how the flowers look like and uh, learn is learning how to distinguish, distinguish them by the looks. And the third um, is audio. As I mentioned before, we're applying computer vision techniques to audio. And one of the uh, extra benefits we get here is that we can apply grad cams to interpret uh, the audio predictions as well. So not only you get the predictions, 
but you also get the highlight areas of which parts of the audio drove the predictions and even which ranges of the frequencies uh, drove the predictions. So uh, that also helps you to understand how model behaves, may validate uh, in terms of understanding of what makes the predictions, uh, what makes the most important, um, highest importance in making predictions for the model. And also to check um, on examples whenever needed that uh, the prediction was made right and using the, the correct pieces of the data. We're working on, uh, uh, we're working on more features. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, we're adding uh, features uh, for um, automating the um, search of the models. Uh, right now you have an opportunity to not only to start a new model, but also trigger a new search uh, and find the best hyperparameters. So kind of automatically tune the model and make even better model than you might have uh, out of the box. Uh, and with lots of customers, we see that uh, there is a struggle with getting uh, proper size data sets because labeling is challenging. But very typically data labels are not available or are costly to, uh, to acquire. Therefore, we're introducing a new application which is integrated into H2AI Cloud and very tightly integrated with Hydrogen Torch that is focused on data management and data labeling. Um, with this application, you will be able to, um, to collect your textual or image data. Uh, audio data will come with the, uh, with the next releases and uh, do the annotations depending on the type you want, on the type of the task you want to solve. Classification, regression, and on this example, we have entity recognition, where, uh, which is designed to build the models that recognize parts of the text or individual words. Um, you will be able to utilize this tool already on AI Cloud. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's well integrated with Hydrogen Torch. Um, so you can, uh, you can upload your data, you can manage your data there, uh, uh, you can manage your uh, annotation pipelines there, and you can directly move the data to Hydrogen Torch and build the model from, from there. Uh, together with text, we're also introducing data labeling for images, um, also classification regression, but also object detection types of the annotations. Uh, of course, we will be adding uh, more and more types of annotation depending on the requests from, from our customers. But already now we cover most of the typical use cases we face whenever we run POC or pro POCs or projects for, with our customers. Besides the integration with the platform, I would like to emphasize the fact that um, this um, tool runs fully inside your environment. So the data never leaves your environment. You don't have to send it over to a cloud to a cloud provider or any external company. So uh, it is very secure from the data privacy point of view. Um, and the last point I would like to mention about the data labeling here is uh, that uh, this application will uh, also grow and uh, provide more and more functionality, not only in, in the direction of data labeling, but also in the direction of active learning. So we're gonna be adding uh, one by one features that will give you AI assisted uh, data annotation uh, techniques. So um, you will have an AI helping you to get, to, give, to make better annotations, to make faster annotations and to make them more efficiently. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, and uh, I'm gonna pass it back to the note. And uh, if you have any questions, please, uh, Paste them in chat, and I will I will answer them. Thank you, Dimitri, uh, for the wonderful presentation. I think uh, there are some phenomenal uh, uh, dates there and new innovations there. Next up, I want to introduce um, uh, Kartik Kuruswamy, who's our principal solution engineer. Um, he's going to present some other innovations and uh, uh, what we have done on document AI. Over to you, Kartik. Thanks, Vinod. Hi, everyone. Um, so what is document.ai? Uh, this is the solutions plus product that runs on Festo AI Cloud. Okay, so um, it supports both uh, a web interface and uh, or you can access by API. What it really does is uh, you can actually upload you know, various image scans like faxes and PDF docs or pictures with text 
right? Or even, you know, Word docs and HTML pages and emails and whatnot. And once you upload it, um, uh, you know, we um, take it through a couple of stages by which you can actually build a model and then uh, you'll be able to infer documents and do things like uh, page classification or token classification. Okay, so uh, before you uh, ask me, oh, is this another OCR? Uh, the answer is it's not. It's uh, uh, OCR is a small part of the entire solution. So we do what is known as an ICR, right? Intelligent character recognition, right? So uh, you have heard, you know, products in the past like Tesseract and things like that. It allows you to extract those you know, words and letters and whatnot are from the text, but it really doesn't understand, it doesn't have document understanding, right? So document understanding requires a couple of things. One, OCR being one part of it. The other part is like, where is the uh, text laid out of the document? And the other one is, and then can you do like named entity recognition and understand, you know, words and keywords and stuff. So this solution combines all of it and stitches together in a very interesting way. Um, it is a somewhat a code-free environment, of, uh, which means that for most part it works, but if you really want to add some code to enrich the pipeline, you can totally do that at the end. So uh, let me give you an idea um, what this can do, okay? Uh, so I have a bunch of documents that I'm going to just pull it up. And let's wait for it. Okay, there we go. Let me move my zoom. Ah, okay. There we go. So this is a lab test document, right? A scanned, obviously. Uh, somebody uh, scanned it. Um, and uh, obviously all of these are anonymized. Uh, so it's uh, pretty cool to show this, right? So there's no um, you know, PII or anything like that. But you can see here, uh, there's various different information like you know, facility name, first name, last name. There's uh, you know, all those panel tests um, uh, most of us are familiar with. And then there's another lab report that has no facility name, slightly different layout, but has somewhat the same information, right? So basically, if you want to sort of generalize this, I, as I go through it, you can even get into like very interesting, um, you know, even formats like this, right? So all of them have the same information, but just laid out differently. So this makes it very hard for an OCR tool, like your, um, you know, a traditional OCR tool, to go and pull all of this up and then format it, and then you can put it in a database or extract information. So this is where document AI comes into play, right? So you can bring all of these documents into the product, and then you can start annotating it, right? Like create some sort of a schema. You can say, hey, you know, these are test description, right? And you don't have to do it one by one. You can just draw a rectangle on top of these, uh, of, uh, you know, layouts. And then our document.ai is intelligent enough to understand that it's actually a table that has different rows and can actually extract those, um, you know, can identify them separately and extract it. Um, you can see like um, um, now we are dealing with documents of various different templates, but it has the same information. So as a user, uh, you need to actually go and um, annotate some of this. So let me quickly show you what that is. The tool looks something like this. And um, I actually drag and drop all these documents into this tool earlier. Uh, you can see like the two, uh, this particular one that I'm showing you right now has got 15, 14 documents that has 24 pages. So not all documents have to have the same number of pages. As long as you can find the information in one or more pages, we can totally bring it in and then, uh, you know, and we can actually uh, build models of it, okay? So let's, let me go and click that. Um, so let's see, yeah, the same document that I showed you, it's in the system, right? So one of the things to note here is that we, I have a document that's a little bit, uh, you know, you can have documents that are even slightly skewed. It doesn't have a perfect rectangle. Uh, sometimes I've seen this work, you know, the iPhone images, it was a little bit tilted, uh, but you don't, you really wanna make sure that it's a readable, right, in some way. Um, and then, you know, you can have, you can see like all the pencil marks here and, you know, it's not a perfect document. And that's exactly what this tool is designed to handle, right? As long as it's readable, as long as it's reasonably good, you can actually bring it in. Now, once you bring it in, there are two things you can do. Like I said, OCR is a small part of it. And so we have to run the OCR on it. Um, so you can go to this document and say, hey, run my OCR. It's going to take care of it, okay? You're going to get the OCR. So let's quickly look at the OCR part and then we'll go to the labeling part. So here we go. 
This is OCR, okay? So it basically extracted all the terms that it found, all the keywords and terms and dates and whatnot and numerics and all of that. It found it, great. It doesn't mean anything because it does, still doesn't know what this table is or what the rows are. So you need to actually tell uh, document.ai that, hey, this is a test, right? Something like that. So um, let me see how I did that. So once you bring in the document, you can actually annotate it. We have an an, uh, manual annotation tool that you can go to the place and pick the regions of interest and you can give it some names like facility name, line test name. So these are named entities that you're creating and associating with the regions, okay? Now, uh, so if you zoom in a little bit, you can see like I have already annotated this. It's telling me the facility name. So easy. If you want to do a date, you just do this and then I create a label called date and then you, it shows up in the drop down box like a test date, right? Uh, sorry, this is a date of birth. So maybe you want a date of birth here if you want to, okay? So you can pull it in. So, so easy to annotate. See, in this case, I annotated the entire table so you don't have to do one by one. So once you do all of that, the next thing we're gonna do is to combine the OCR annotations together and stitch it together to create some sort of a, a, a data that's ready for training, okay? So here is the, your OCR label data, which is like, there's a way to combine it. I'm not gonna show you like every step, but once you have these two, you can go and say annotate and apply labels and you're gonna get this. So you go here and this is the fully annotated um, and OCR data. So let's go in and look at one of um, one of the documents. Okay, I know it's crowded, so I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. There we go. Okay, you can see facility name, the text is lab corp, right? So basically it's used, it used your annotation and used the OCR and it created uh, some sort of a connection between the region, your entity and the OCR text. So uh, all of this preparation is done in document AI. The only thing you need to do is to annotate. Now the question is, do I need to annotate? I have 100,000 documents. Do I need to annotate 80,000 of them for training? The answer is no, okay? So because we have pre-trained layout LM models, you can actually uh, label a sample of these documents um, that has a reasonable representation of the rest of the documents. And then you can, um, when we actually train the model, we'll be fine tuning an existing pre-trained model that was already trained on level million documents, right? So it's transfer learning. And then we're just updating the embeddings by creating a training here, okay? And then once you create a model, it's very easy to go back and then deploy it. Um, so let's go back to the projects. Um, okay, you can say publish pipeline once, and then it's gonna ask you for a model name to create the model, and then you're gonna get a rest endpoint, okay? And then once you have a rest endpoint, now uh, from the client or an application, you can basically load um, you know, a PDF or image, you can upload it and we'll show you the steps on how to do that. There's documentation on that. And then once the document comes to the rest endpoint, the OCR will be done, the model scoring will be done and you're gonna get a JSON uh, you know, output that talks about which region, which named entity uh, that you define and what is the text that was found, right? That can be used for downstream application. So here's an interesting thing. We just don't do predictions. We also tell you how confident we are in terms of what we're finding, right? We say, okay, 80% or 90% confident that the label that I picked up uh, was in the prediction. So then you can add something like a post processor. You can do it here itself. Uh, you can add a final pipeline to sort of curate the output that is coming. And then you can decide whether you wanna present that prediction confidently to uh, the downstream application. So this is something you can do in Python. You can upload it. You, you get a handle on the JSON and you can just convert it into a CSV file or whatever format uh, that can go into a database or you know, to a downstream application. So that's, the, uh, you know, that's what the tool does. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, so basically, uh, if you just look at a high level, what it does, it allows an enterprise to go beyond OCR-based template methods, right? And also uh, robotic process automation-based uh, tools, which are generally focused on memorization and all the documents have to be the same in the exact same place. This one is a um, highly intelligent, you know, has a much better understanding of the documents. And it also gives you a hand to go and, uh, you know, uh, tell, tell it like where to find things initially not exactly in the same place, but kind of put the identities around it, like bounding boxes, and then it learns. 
The whole point is that you have lower operational cost. Imagine processing like you know hundred thousand documents right um, um, really quickly, like get through the day, right? And able to generate the predictions is highly efficient. And overall, you know, if you're, if you're a business where you have to respond to customers really quickly based on what they uploaded, uh, so this allows you to create customer satisfaction, right? Much better customer satisfaction. So that's all I have uh, uh, for document.ai. I, uh, unless there are any questions, I can answer those questions in the chat. Uh, I'm gonna pass the ball back, uh, ball to, I guess, uh, Vinod and Michelle. Uh, uh, it's an XP. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Karthik, um, uh, for the wonderful. I think uh, document is like a really powerful technology that can allow us to process, uh, you know, all kinds of formats, different templates, even non-templated uh, use cases. So, uh, highly encourage you to try it out. It's available again on our managed cloud and our AI cloud as well. With that, I'm going to introduce um, uh, Michelle Tanko, who is the product manager for AI Cloud and uh, Wave uh, and then App Store itself. So, she's going to talk about all the innovations coming up in there. Over to you, Michelle. Great, thanks, Vinod. All right, so we've talked about a few different things today, but I want to give a quick overview of our end-to-end -end platform, the H2O AI Cloud. So everything you've seen so far and that you're going to see later is in this end-to-end -end platform. Um, this includes our feature store for understanding your features and handling feature pipelines, um, all the ways to build models. So deep learning models with Dimitri, um, Karthik just showed us Document AI. We'll talk to Megan soon about our distributed ML and maybe auto ML as well. Um, and all of these options are available in one place. So this is a scalable platform for your organization. Um, as Vinod mentioned earlier, this can run managed. So hosted by H2O, so you don't have to worry about the Kubernetes infrastructure or any of that, or it can be hosted in your organization, which some of our larger customers are doing um, that have that type of uh, IT support. This runs in Kubernetes, so it scales up and down as your end users need more AI engines for building models or more apps for showing results to end users. And it comes with everything we've been doing at H2O for the last decade. So AI engines for building your different types of models, whether this is distributed models in our open source platform H2O3 or driverless AI for automated machine learning with that um, genetic algorithm that finds the best algorithm for you, um, Hydrogen Torch for deep learning, and DocAI for our end-to-end -end document solutions. Um, from building these models, I'm so sorry, I'm going to unmute for just a moment. All right, after we build our models, we can use MLOps to deploy these models and we'll see that today and run them in production. And our deployed models help us enable the App Store, which has our AI applications. These are apps that are built by H2O and also built by you in our organizations. So we have data science best practice applications, and then we have uh, core vertical applications in healthcare, financial services, and templates, so you can easily get started making your own. So with this overview, we'll go ahead and get into um, what's new in the end-to-end -end platform. There's uh, three main things I want to show you today. Um, the first is we now have a hosted solution for Jupyter Labs, so you can run your notebooks directly from the environment. You no longer have to access APIs from your local machines or your local developer station. It's fully hosted by us in the cloud platform. Um, and then we have two new features for Managed Cloud I want to talk about, um, some improvements for our object storage that allows you to upload your data once and use it throughout the entire platform, and then some admin features that will be interesting for our admins in the Managed Cloud environments. All right. So here I am in the H2O AI Cloud homepage. We talked about this at the last innovation day, but this is a landing page for everything you might want to do in the platform. Um, different types of users might see different things here, but at the top, I can see my main end-to-end -end workflow. I can upload data. I can access the different types of modeling, building tools that I want. I can see my deployed models, and then I can also access everything via code if I'm a data scientist or someone that um, uses Jupyter Notebooks. In the center, I have things that I specifically own. So this is gonna be a little bit different for every person. Um, app instances are UIs uh, for AI applications that I specifically own and might want to access regularly. My favorite apps are in the center. And then anything as a developer that I've personally uploaded will be here so I can access it easily. And we can see other interesting things lower in the cloud. So the first thing I wanna talk about is our new managed notebook solution. 
So directly from the AI Cloud, I can go into the details of the H2AI notebooks, which is instances of Jupyter Labs. Now, why instances is interesting is because each person can run one or more Jupyter Lab environments. So here I can see several people have public instances of Jupyter Labs running. And if I go click visit, it will go into my latest version of it. In this environment, it comes automatically set up to easily use the AI Cloud environment. So we are using um, the data science Docker image. So it comes with things like scikit-learn and other model building tools um, installed if you want it. But you also have access to all of our APIs. So there's some example data that you can use for playing around. We also have example notebooks, um, an end-to-end -end demo that shows you how to get into driverless AI, how to build a model, how to then deploy that model into MLOps and start scoring predictions. And then we have deep dive tutorials for each of our uh, products. So how to manage your AI engines and keep track of resources, how to uh, build and understand on mid machine learning and so forth. Um, and then if you're not familiar with Jupyter Labs, it's really easy to take one of these tutorials, just duplicate it and then change it to your own uh, use case and you can run all your Python code directly from here. You don't have to install any libraries or anything, although you can because you have access in this environment. Um, one of the things I wanted to show you related to this, though, is you have control for each of your instances of Jupyter Labs and of all apps in the App Store to say if it's only for you or if it's for all users. So I can go into my instances, which is the app instances that I specifically own. And I can see that um, I actually have an instance of Jupyter Labs that's private. So I have some notebooks in here that I don't actually want other people to run or look at. I'm not ready to share them yet. But when I have an instance that's all users, then what I can do is I can send a link to a notebook to one of my colleagues and they could run it or they could copy it or use it in their own environment as well. Um, so it's a nice way to start to do collaboration on code or model building together. All right. So next I'm going to come back to my homepage and I'm going to go to Drive where I'm going to show you how we can um, upload data and some new features in the Drive. Um, so the purpose of Drive is to be one place to organize all your files you're using the AI Cloud. So Feature Store is focused on our features that we use for model building. It shows you the overview of features. You can see the summary statistics and so forth. But Drive, we might not just have data sets. We might have the output of machine learning models, um, whether that's predictions or a mojo or an auto doc. And all of that can be saved in one place so I can access it in different apps, different AI engines, and so forth. So you don't have to spend a lot of time uploading and downloading data and moving it all around. It's just in Drive for you. Um, one of the new things in Drive is a nice import manager that allows you to import multiple files at once um, a lot more smoothly. So we wanted to show that today. So I'm going to choose to um, import from S3, but as you can see, there's lots of different connectors available to me. Um, and from S3, ahead of time, I went ahead and um, put in my credentials. These are saved for me securely so that I don't have to import them every time. I can just um, access it. And if I have multiple credentials, I can set up those different profiles as well. So I'll use those credentials and I will get the link of where my data is, some public data. And then I'm just going to go ahead and hit next. And I'll choose a couple files that I might be interested in. Um, let's let's play with the airline sentiment. So after I import these, um, these aren't necessarily particularly huge files, but oh, that's fair. I imported those earlier today. So this is nice. It's checking for me if I really do actually want to import these data sets and override them. I'll go ahead and give them a new name. In this case, it would be okay to override, but just in case. Um, and we'll go show all and we can see the import manager here and I can watch as each file imports. If one of these was say 100 gigabytes or something that was a bit larger, it would take longer to use, but I'd be able to use all the other files while it was going. I'm going to now take us really quick just to show you how we can then use this data set in other places. Um, I'm going to go into driverless AI. going to redirect from me. There we go. Click on into driverless AI. So this is our tool for automated model building. We're not going to go through it too much right now, um, but I just wanted to show how we can then use the data that we just imported. Um, so I'll go back to the root here 
and I can see here's my airline sentiment too that I had just um, added. And I can go ahead and add that right into this instance of driverless AI. So we don't have to re-import it from S3 or worry about S3 credentials here. All right. And then the last thing I want to show you is some of our new admin features. Um, so I'm going to come into a different environment where I happen to be an admin, because these are features only available to admins. Um, so yeah, anyway, uh, I'll come into Admin Center and visit this application. And again, this is for our Managed Cloud customers. So you don't have to be like a Kubernetes admin or understand the backend IT, but there are things that you might wanna do to be able to control and understand your environment. So I can do firewall management, which essentially says um, by default, uh, any IP can access the AI Cloud environment, but you might wanna make this more strict. So the reason that it would be nice to access the environment is maybe I don't wanna use the managed notebook solution. I really wanna run the, the notebook on my local machine for whatever reason, um, then I'd be allowed to connect from my local machine. So that can be controlled here for security. And the other way around, you can let the AI Cloud um, access or not access outside resources. So our admins can make sure they understand the security here of who's talking to your platform and who's not. The user management allows you to add new users into your environment. I'm not gonna show everyone's email today, um, but you can easily add and remove accounts and change access. And then the newest feature here is our AI unit consumption. So the AI Cloud platform is um, consumption-based. We're looking at how often and how many resources and AI um, units, which is based on um, storage and memory and CPU and GPU are being used all at once. So here our admins can easily see what our consumption is, what capacity it is. So this environment has access to 14 units. Right now we're using less than one, so we're really low on capacity, but we can see over time if there's any spikes. Um, right now as I'm doing this demo, there is a higher spike of course, and uh, as so forth. So this gives our admins a little more insight and visibility into what's going on in their platform um, in terms of what it might end up costing them. And then there's a little bit more details about the environment. All right. So um, at this point, I'm going to go ahead and stop and uh, introduce our next presenter, who's going to be um, Abhishek Mathur, who's going to talk about MLOps and responsible AI. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and hey, everyone. Uh, good to see a lot of uh, good engagement coming in uh, in the chat. Uh, and uh, making sure that we're getting uh, all of your questions answered. So I'm going to talk uh, about uh, MLOps and uh, responsible AI, uh, as uh, Michelle just mentioned. And uh, I want to kind of start off uh, the overall uh, conversation going a little bit deeper on MLOps. So just before me, Michelle had started talking about what is included in um, overall H2O AI cloud. Um, and this uh, diagram over here uh, starts to talk a little bit more about deeper uh, level uh, information on MLOps and what is really a uh, part of that. So MLOps is your end-to-end uh, -end place where you come in to manage, deploy, and monitor your uh, machine learning models. Um, so from, from a uh, H2O's AI cloud standpoint uh, we, and MLOps standpoint, we're uh, completely agnostic towards whatever the model is uh, that you've got, whether you've trained the model on uh, uh, H2O's um, uh, AI engines or you've trained the model outside of that, um, our model management and ML ops capabilities is able to be agnostic towards any of those and take you through the overall uh, workflow of uh, um, model management, deployment, and monitoring. Effectively, anything that comes after the model gets uh, trained um, all throughout our uh, ML ops platform. Uh, we also uh, enable a lot of different third-party integrations that allow you to use your favorite tools uh, and bring them into and connect them into um, uh, H2O's MLOps. Uh, and then we also provide uh, lots of team collaboration, management, analytics capabilities, uh, governance capabilities, and infrastructure that allows you to configure your workflow for uh, uh, the best possible scenarios that you've got within your organization. Um, and all of this, once a model is actually uh, deployed and being monitored, uh, that gets consumed into a variety of different uh, AI applications whether you're uh, building this directly into a uh, end user application, or you've got some level of predictions happening um, within uh, a tool that you've got uh, you know, scoring internally, 
all of that can be made possible through um, our H2 MLOps. So that's a very quick overview on uh, what H2 MLOps actually is. Uh, and now let's dive deeper into what are some of the new innovations that have happened within this space. The first one I want to talk about is our enhanced model monitoring capability. So uh, some of our customers in the past have uh, gone through and used our existing model monitoring capability. Um, and there have been some uh, friction points with uh, our SSO or single sign. We have now brought in our model monitoring capability all within the same application of uh, uh, MLOps. Uh, and our users are able to interact and get all of their monitoring details for the models all in the same place. You're able to get uh, details for, about your model health, your model prediction details, uh, the features that are getting consumed the most, um, as well as a drift that is happening on your features um, over time. Uh, so of course, um, this is uh, where we're kind of starting off, bringing everything together in one single place uh, for our customers. Lots more capabilities that are coming up uh, on top of this uh, soon. So that's really the first thing I want to talk about is the enhanced model monitor. The second capability I'm super excited to talk about is our H2O's model analyzer. This is a brand new product uh, that we are uh, that we, we've been working on for a little while and we want to release now to our customers, which helps our users and our customers start to understand how robust their model is. And the way we talk about robustness is really to look at some of the edge cases and edge areas where the model has not seen any data around seeing how the model behaves in those spaces and see if the model is actually perturbing or uh, changing the prediction value or not based off of something that the model has not actually seen. So there are a few different techniques that we have enabled within uh, uh, H2O's model analyzer. We have things like counterfactual explanations, which help our users understand the closest example within a data set that actually perturbs a prediction or uh, changes the overall prediction. We also have adversarial explanations, which uh, goes in and tries to break the model actively and uh, uh, figures out what is the smallest amount of feature change or feature value change that would actually perturb uh, the prediction. And it also allows you to do what if analysis. You're able to look at all of your feature values, change uh, uh, any number of them uh, and change the value for them and see in a what if basis, what happens to the overall prediction. And all of this data really kind of goes in and you're able to save it uh, in order for you to retrain your model and make the model more robust. So let's take a look at how that works. So you can uh, access uh, H2O's model analyzer from our H2O AI cloud right here. Uh, I've got my, the model analyzer app uh, as a pinned app for myself. So I'm just gonna click here. And once I click on visit, it's gonna open this application. So in this homepage, what I can see is I've got a number of different uh, data sets and models that have been preloaded. So I'm just going to click uh, quickly click on one particular data set. So over here, I've got my entire data set and I've got a model uh, already loaded for it. And I can see there's about 6,000 different uh, values uh, that are uh, over here uh, that are uh, paginated across um, uh, the, uh, the existing view. So what I really want to do is try to see for a given, uh, given uh, data sets, so for example, rows uh, index one and index two, um, what is the closest way I can perturb it or figure out what is a weak point uh, for these particular data points? So I'm gonna click on run and then start. I'm gonna choose all of the features because I want all of them to be uh, made available for myself uh, before I actually uh, go in and start to exclude any. Um, so all these features are available to be changed in order for me to try uh, to change the prediction. So the job has been finished and I can click on view the report. And over here, very quickly, I can see that for each of the uh, rows that I had predicted or, uh, or that I had selected, I'm able to uh, change particular values, change the education value from three to two, age from 49 to 37, uh, and then be able to change the model prediction uh, uh, values from a 65 to a 41. And similarly, for the other uh, um, data point that I've actually looked at as well, um, for that, I have had to change a few different values, um, uh, as you can see in orange. And that changed the uh, overall model prediction value from 71 to 42. 
So this is really, really important when uh, we uh, as uh, data scientists, when we as uh, model uh, validators want to go in and try to identify what the weak points of the model actually are. And then I can use the results that were produced based off of this to go ahead and, uh, sorry, to go ahead um, and uh, use the new data points and see if the prediction value is actually uh, accurate or not. And I can go and retrain the model using these data points to make my model more robust. Um, so that's that's one capability that this tool uh, provides, being able to uh, see the adversary examples. The other thing is I'm just going to click on one particular value, and I can see all the features that I have uh, within this particular uh, model. And I can uh, go right to the bottom and see uh, what are the explanations uh, for this. So which feature is the most uh, contributing the most positively or the most negatively to model prediction? And this allows me to do conduct what if analysis on my side. So for example, I can look at uh, the value of pay five uh, and start to change this up since it has uh, the most, uh, uh, it has uh, the highest feature importance. So I can change the value from two through seven, go to my inference tab and predict. Or I can go from seven back to negative two and click predict based off of that and see how the model prediction is actually changing. And once again, this what if analysis helps uh, our customers, our users uh, identify where the model can potentially break. So extremely powerful tool that we think our customers are going to have a great time uh, uh, playing around with and making their model more and more robust. So that's model analyzer in a nutshell. The next uh, feature that I wanna talk uh, more about is our experiment tracking feature. And within our MLOps, experiment tracking is also brand new and uh, a, a, a term that is getting more and more popular uh, amongst the overall MLOps industry. So within H2O's experiment tracking, we're allowing our customers to log their model parameters, artifacts, and metrics uh, programmatically in order for you to keep track of all of your experimentation details. Data scientists that we work with, they, uh, they are running tens, if not hundreds of experiments all in parallel with slight modifications on their uh, parameters. And what they're really looking at uh, understanding is how does uh, each experiment um, uh, and yield different uh, overall metrics. And traditionally, our customers have done this all throughout a spreadsheet in a really manual way. And experiment tracking really helps our data scientists automate that process, visualize that process, and helps them create an end-to-end -end lineage for their experiments. So let's take a look at what that looks like. Um, I've got experiment tracking currently running in a Jupyter notebook right now, um, effectively just uh, initializing the uh, experiment tracking client from my side uh, and then uh, getting all of the modules installed. And then at this point, I can start to um, uh, get my uh, username registered and getting the overall client uh, registered. So I just need to get my uh, authentication token really quickly, which I'll do right here. And then input the values over here and I am authenticated. At this point, I can go in and start uh, uh, going ahead with my, uh, with my iterations. So I'm just gonna register uh, an iteration name as any name and then start to log parameters. So over here, I'm logging um, uh, two parameters over here, running that, and that's starting to get registered, registering some uh, metrics, for example, RMSC and R squared, and also registering artifacts. So very quickly, as you can see, I can incorporate a couple of lines of code uh, within my overall um, um, experiment uh, code base and start to log details of what is the actual uh, feature, um, what is the actual parameters that I'm logging with, or sorry, train the experiment with? What are the uh, output uh, metrics and any uh, artifacts that are associated with my experiment? And just like that, I, am, I can head into a UI that we've built out that we're actually consuming right now from uh, the open source ML flow platform. And we will see over here that uh, H2 Innovation Aid, that's what I had named my experiment 
all of these different uh, parameters and uh, metrics uh, and artifacts that I have logged, uh, you can view them over here. So these are all uh, individually logging metrics, parameters, uh, and artifacts. But what we have over here is also uh, a uh, integration with an H203 model. Um, so a model is getting trained over here and it starts to log all of the uh, uh, parameters, metrics, artifact details. It's just uh, running um, the overall, uh, uh, this code block right now. Uh, but what we'll see is very quickly, as I refresh, uh, we are now logging our random forest H203 model. And it is now, uh, all of the uh, parameters are getting captured over here. All of the metrics are getting captured over here and any metadata values that have uh, sent in. So this is super, super powerful for our customers who are looking to uh, experiment uh, with lots of uh, different experiments all in parallel. Uh, and uh, let me show you how a comparative view actually looks like on this as well. Uh, because uh, once we have uh, many, many different experiments happening together, uh, we want to be able to compare the values. So I've got a scikit-learn model and I've got a H2H3 random forest model. I'm going to select both of them and click compare. And I can start to visualize uh, the different values that I'm getting uh, from or that I have inputted uh, in and logged into uh, each of the different models. I can look at the different uh, run details. I can look at different parameters that went in and I can look at uh, metrics that should be logged here as well. And that helps me very simply uh, compare my different experiments against each other and helps the data scientists really go ahead and uh, select the best experiment that they have on their side. So going back over here and um, uh, finishing off some of the new innovation that we've built out over here, we think this is an extremely powerful uh, product uh, within the overall MLOps portfolio that helps our uh, users track the end-to-end -end lineage of their experiment, compare experiments very simply, log all the details in one place that they can then pull afterwards, uh, as well as visualize all of the results on their side uh, such that they can um, uh, view, compare, and contrast different experiments that they have run. So that's really, um, in a nutshell, uh, what we've got uh, over the last uh, couple of months. So a uh, quick overview on a roadmap of what we're looking at doing as well to enhance the capabilities even further of MLOps. We're looking at enhancing our experiment tracking capability and integrating that directly uh, with our H2 MLOps, such that you can log an experiment detail uh, within um, uh, experiment tracking, and then very quickly bring that into MLOps for deployment purposes. So that's a capability that we're working on integration, and that's going to be available very soon uh, for all of you. Uh, we're also looking at uh, enhancing our uh, model explanations at runtime in, uh, within MLOps. So previously, um, a lot of our customers had been using our popular feature of uh, um, getting explanations at runtime for models that are in the Mojo format. We're now going to be opening that up into uh, getting explanations for uh, models that are in the Python scoring pipeline. Um, we're also, uh, within monitoring, we're going to be adding uh, much more capabilities around feature importance and data set management. Um, and for our uh, another mon monitoring addition, we're going to be uh, allowing our customers to do third-party deployment monitoring. So models will be able to be able to deploy it anywhere outside of the H2O uh, infrastructure, and monitoring could be done by H2O. So that, in a nutshell, is uh, what, we're, what we have been up to and what we are uh, going to be working on on MLOps to give you a bit of a view uh, into uh, uh, the overall product. And now I'm gonna jump into uh, our responsible AI portfolio. Uh, responsible AI is, uh, uh, if you've been using H2O for a little while, uh, you know uh, that H2O has some of the more powerful uh, machine learning interpretability and responsible AI capabilities um, across the market, across the industry. Um, so we have, just as a recap, over 20 different techniques that are available through our driverless AI a product, um, which allow you to interpret models in a wide variety of different ways. And what we're looking at doing now, and what we're happy to announce now is opening that up, the capabilities and the power that we have built out within driverless AI for our MLI, uh, and opening that up to any product, any framework, and any model 
that is uh, that you are building your model for. So we are launching H2O Sonar, uh, which is a library, a Python package that has a wide variety of responsible AI methods and techniques all into a single place. So if you are looking at uh, operationalizing responsible AI within your organization, you no longer have to go through lots of different libraries with inconsistent formats, inconsistent uh, data uh, ingestions, and all come straight to H2O Sonar and be able to get all of your responsible AI needs uh, irrespective of what uh, frameworks or models you're working with. So uh, this is uh, absolutely brand new and we're launching this um, right now. Um, the model frameworks that we are currently supporting are Scikit-Learn and H203 uh, on top of the driverless AI ones. And we will be adding more and more frameworks on top of this. And the current methods and techniques that we're supporting are uh, SHAP values, uh, partial dependence, so PD and uh, ICE, um, decision tree surrogate model, um, disparate impact analysis or DIA, and kernel SHAP's feature importance. So once again, uh, these are also the capabilities that we currently have right now. And we will be expanding this and incorporating all of the innovation that we've already done on the driverless AI's MLI side and bringing that into H2O Sonar. So let's take a look at how that works. So once again, I'm gonna go into uh, my uh, Python notebook and I've got um, uh, a PD ICE uh, explainer that I've got uh, as a notebook kind of running over here. Uh, <clears throat> so just importing all of the uh, necessary libraries and uh, data sets. Uh, I can then go in and run the actual explainer, the PD ICE explainer, which gives me all the details for the explainer uh, right here. So all the different parameters, all the values that I can go in and look deeper into, uh, that will be I'll put it right. Uh, at this point, uh, I want to make sure that the model that I have is also loaded. So over here, I've got a second learn model uh, that is loaded uh, and set up. And with this, I can run the actual explainer on the model that I've got. So now that the explainer is actually run, I can now uh, run this code block to get the actual results uh, and get a summary. So the summary of the PD ICE is uh, shown very quickly as the calculations are done. And then uh, not just that, I can then hit a couple of visualization and charting um, uh, outputs that we've got in order for me to actually see the resultant data for any particular feature. So for the education feature, I can see the, the um, PD values or the pay for, which is a feature that we've got, I can see the values for that as well. So that's just a tabular view that we've got going. Um, you can also visualize this in any way uh, that you want as well. We've got a couple of samples over here uh, for both education and pay for. And you can see very quickly that I can visualize uh, the PD results um, in uh, 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 a histogram or a line chart format. And we also have the capability for us to save and log all of the data and the outputs that we've got uh, in uh, a few different libraries as well. So all of this is uh, available uh, for us to use. Uh, we are, uh, we have released this in a uh, limited preview at the moment. Um, so um, uh, if you are a customer of ours and you want to try this out, uh, please reach out to your account manager and we're happy to get you access uh, so you can get going on this. Um, so th that is what the team has been working on so far, uh, but what is coming up uh, next for Responsible AI? Uh, and I'm happy to uh, talk a little bit more about the roadmap on AI governance. So AI governance uh, is something that we are currently working on very, very hard uh, on trying to uh, help our customers operationalize Responsible AI within their organization, within their teams. What this is going to actually incorporate is a dashboard that we can provide to an uh, executive audience that gives them an overall view of risk for all of their AI projects across the organization. Uh, it's going to have a, a, a set of tools that our AI practitioners or AI project teams can use to identify any areas of concerns, run all the tests that are needed, and uh, uh, tooling to help remediate any of the issues that are over there. And also a system of record that is helping uh, our, our customers and organizations store, manage, and retrieve any of the data and metadata that is needed for the AI projects. So we're, we're excited to be working on this right now. We think it's going to be incredibly valuable. Uh, some of the customers that we have uh, had early conversations on, they've had very positive feedback on this so far. Um, and uh, we're going to be happy to show um, how this is all coming about um, at the next event. 
And with that, I will pass uh, this on to Megan Kirka, uh, who is going to be talking about H203. Hi, everybody. Thanks, All right. Um, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about H203 and some of the capabilities available there. Um, and I'm, I'm a data scientist at H2O, um, Megan, just uh, as an introduction, and I work with um, the H2O3 and driverless products. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about H2O3 today, just to end the discussion. Um, H2O3 is our, our platform for distributed machine learning. Um, it's completely open source um, and able to ingest large amounts of data by creating clusters. So you'll see it on the screen. We have a bunch of different algorithms in H2O, some supervised, some unsupervised. We also have AutoML there as well. I and mean, then with H203, um, you can launch a cluster as large as you want that can ingest the full data set. I and mean, you're able to interact with it from different languages and IDEs. Um, and today I'll show a quick demo of using our hosted Jupyter Notebook um, to run a model with H203. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be focusing on anomaly detection in H203. We've had anomaly detection for some time, but we've recently added extended isolation for us, which I'll discuss. Um, and I wanted to bring it to the forefront. So how can we um, essentially find odd or suspicious behaviors in our data, even if it's large data? And some of the reasons why we might want to do that is um, fraud detection, sensor malfunction, help with stock trading, or even detecting bot. So Anomaly detection is really great if um, we want to be alerted that something strange is happening with our data, but we might not have a label for it. So we've been talking a lot about machine learning um, and labeling and so on. And um, this is a great setup if you don't have labels for when things are fraudulent, when there's a bot per se, or there's been a malfunction, you just want to know when there might be something alarming happening in your data set. So anomaly detection's goal is really to figure out the um, general patterns that are happening in your data and identify places where that doesn't fit. There are three methods for anomaly detection in H203 um, in an unsupervised manner. So unsupervised meaning I don't really have a label for when things go a wire, but I want to figure out if I can detect that in, in advance. Um, the first is clustering. So H203 offers k-means clustering, again, on a full distributed data set to find natural segments in the data. We can use this algorithm to determine which observations cannot be clustered well. So an observation that can't be clustered well doesn't somehow fit in with the rest of the patterns. H203 also has dimensionality reduction algorithms, which learn a low representation of your data. Um, and it uses this to find common patterns in your data. What we can then do is figure out which observations can't be easily reconstructed. So where does the low dimensionality model get things wrong? And then finally, our most recent algorithm is isolation forest. And what this does is it trains trees in your data set to determine um, uh, how, how easy it is to separate an observation from the rest of the group. So observations that are easily separated um, are more likely to be anomalies. All three of these algorithms and techniques are available in H203. Um, they're distributed, so they're going to work with your full data set. And what's nice about all of the three of these things is that they produce a mojo. So you'll get a Java object that's independent of H203. So you can use to um, kind of deploy uh, an anomaly detection model in production. So what's new in anomaly detection? We've added extended isolation forest. It's, a, it's an algorithm that um, removes the bias of isolation forest and it's especially um, beneficial when you have wide data. We've also added some tutorials on how to use anomaly detection. Um, and I'll show a little bit about how we can put that all together. So maybe anomaly detection is only my first step, but as we talked about in the panel, there's also the work of engaging with our business group, explaining why something is an anomaly, productionizing it, and so on. So when I talk about putting it all together and explaining it, um, what we can do with H203 is not only build these algorithms to predict which observations are anomalous, but we can explain that. Um, so here, for example, I have some home price data. I've identified from my isolation, isolation forest model that this is anomalous, and I can get these Shapley reason codes about why, they're, why it is anomalous. So I built a surrogate model. Um, I'll show the tutorial in a, in a minute. Um, I figured out which um, variables lead to a high anomaly score, and then I get at an individual level information about why this record is strange. So now I can go ahead and take this information and provide this to a business group or explain each anomaly as it comes up to better identify why it is strange and what we should do about it. 
So putting it all together in the AI cloud, although H203 um, is available, everyone can try it with the AI cloud, I can kind of add steps together to help me um, make this information available to a large variety of users and to speed line this particular use case to monetizing my, my business. So I can define the objective, start building experiments in this case with H203, explain them just like I talked about. We can also enable a bigger group with some low code apps. So I'm gonna just show really quickly a wave app that I've built um, that combines the results of H203 so that I can show, showcase it to a large user and then evolve. How can I monetize this information of when something is anomalous to help, um, help uh, optimize my, my goal? So let me just jump to my demo really quick. So here's our AI cloud environment. Um, as Michelle showed, we have a Jupyter notebook. Um, here I've connected to my H203 cluster. I've imported some data and I built an anomaly detection model to figure out which records are anomalous. I can then um, explain it with a surrogate decision tree model, um, figure out what's leading to anomalous scores, explain them, and explain them at a, at a particular individual level. So this is something common that a data scientist would do, um, but I can also put all this together in an app. So here's a Wave app. Wave is our open source um, uh, software Python library that allows to make a low code uh, dashboards and applications. And I've made an, a dashboard that's interactive that showcases um, the results of my H203 model. So even though H203 is really running distributed and running on large data, um, I can reduce the size of the data down for a dashboard purpose, see where my anomalies are located in a two-dimensional form, get a nice table with my anomalies, and then even click and view more details. So with, uh, with the AI Cloud, we're able to kind of put all this together and showcase the results um, to a wide variety of users and see, see how it can be helpful for the business. Um, all right, with that, I think we're about at the end of time. So I'll pass it over to Vinod to, um, to, to wrap everything up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, uh, for the wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Um, I just want to bring uh, Michelle back real quick um, to just uh, talk about some of the new updates on Wave. Uh, Michelle, if you are ready. Is that Michelle? I'm getting there. We're just at time. I didn't know we were going to jump back in. Yeah, just take one more. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, so Megan just showed us the Wave website, but really quick, h 2 Wave is a uh, SDK in Python and R that allows you to build front-end applications. So when you think about the machine learning workflow and building your models, um, if we build a model that can say, for example, predict churn, we might want to know if churn happens or not for our customer support team when someone calls in. Well, they're not gonna run a curl command to a model deployed in ML ops and try to get a prediction. Having some sort of um, interaction with a front end that allows us to do something with our predictions can be really helpful. And a lot of times our data scientists don't necessarily have a full stack skill set. They might not know front end developing like HTML or JavaScript or CSS. So Wave has a component library that allows you to easily build interactive front ends like the one Megan just showed, um, and then uh, deploy those into the AI cloud or the app store. So. Um, what we're gonna talk about for Wave today is a new feature called Wave Studio that actually allows you to start building your applications directly from the AI cloud. Or if you're running a Wave completely in open source, you can run this on your local machine as well. Um, but you no longer have to use your favorite IDE like PyCharm, VS Code, or VI if you're really cool. You can um, have an IDE directly in your browser. So I'll go ahead and show you what that looks like. So I'm going to go back to my cloud environment. And I will go ahead into the app store and specifically search for the app I'm interested in, which today is Wave Studio. And we'll run into it. Um, again, each user could have their own instance of this app. So I'm going to go to mine where I'm building my own applications. All right, so here's an app that I've built and it's deploying it for me, but I'm gonna actually go into the studio. It's a different, um, slightly different URL in this application. And here you can see my IDE. So on the one side, I have the different projects that I'm working on and code that I'm writing. And then here is a rendered display of the app I'm building. Um, I can choose if I wanna see the console logs, which might be interesting to know um, 
how my app is running and, and logs that I might print out to it as a developer. Um, I can just do the code if I want to. Um, and again, this app is actually running here. So if I wanna see it full, I can come into the new tab here. Um, this is a live ID and editor. So I added in this nice little card as I was testing, but I can delete it and it goes away. Um, we do have UI hints for Wave. So I can say I would like to create a new card. I want it to be called my card. And then what do I want it? Well, there's a lot of different types of cards, but I might want this one to be a header card. Let's do, let's search for header. And it's gonna go ahead and populate the text I need for a header card here. So I need to give it a location, a title and a subtitle. Um, I'm gonna get rid of this card at the top. I don't need it while we're talking right now, but it's gonna go into the top right-hand corner. It's gonna go all the way across the screen and be one unit tall. And I'm gonna say my test with no subtitle. And you can see that app is updating live as we go. So we can write our code here, see it rendered directly. And then if we wanted to, we could download this application. Um, some exciting things coming to you in the future for this for like automatic deployments to the cloud and so forth. But we just wanted today to show you what um, is coming next. And this is available um, for you to start playing around with in our, our open source um, PR branch. All right, thanks Vinod. Thanks, Michelle. Um, thanks everyone for staying along. I know this is like a, a fairly long uh, early morning webinar, but um, uh, some phenomenal questions. We'll try to answer some of the other questions that came on uh, separately outside of the call. I want to thank all the panelists earlier and all the product managers for coming and presenting. Uh, as you saw, there's a ton of phenomenal announcements. We had uh, uh, starting with the uh, feature store, going to Hydrogen Torch via, with the labeling app um, and also uh, the audio uh, use cases that are being supported now coming to MLOps, we have a lot of new innovations like experiment tracking, model analyzer. Um, we have Sonar, which is our uh, uh, responsible AI library for model explanations. We have a lot of uh, exciting things on document AI, um, uh, how, we, uh, uh, like how powerful that can be to solve a lot of use cases that we didn't cover before in H2O. And not to mention AI Cloud itself and Wave and H2O3. So, um, uh, I encourage everyone to go try it out. If you go to h2.ai slash free, or if you go to the main website itself, the homepage, there's a call to action. You can go sign up for our free trial and start accessing all of these capabilities immediately. So uh, let us know what you think. If you have questions, concerns, um, I know hit us up in uh, yeah, email or go join our community Slack. It's another great place to interact with all the h2 product managers on the team. Awesome. Thanks, Vino. Thanks, everybody, for attending. We really appreciate it. And yeah, we're, we're innovating on your behalf. So let us know what you need and, uh, and we'll keep making. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks.